You're listening to episode 99 of Mida Life Radio. I'm your host, Matt Blackburn. Today, I'm speaking once again with Mr. Adam Bergstrom. Adam's one of my favorite guests to speak with. Every time I have him on, I learn so much and I feel energized after I speak with him. It's just really fun to go back and forth with him. And he actually just released two new ebooks. One more on yellow fat disease. And he's actually been doing sex newsletters, just kind of breaking down myths that people have around that subject. And I think all of his books are amazing. He actually has one called Yellow Fat Disease Compendium for 100 bucks, And it's over 275 pages. And it's all of his books on yellow fat disease, uh, even future books <laughs> in there. And so that's a really good value if you're skeptical about this whole lipofuscan and yellow fat disease thing, or like me, if you had an omega-3 nutritional supplement and you walked away from it or thinking of walking away from that product or brand or whatever it is, this may give you the confidence to do that and see that Omega-3 DHA poisoning is 100% real and lethal, and a lot of people have it. And he goes into all the different names for it in this interview. Well, not all of them, but he mentions a few. Muscular dystrophy is another name for progressive lipofuscinosis. Pansteatitis is one of those. That's a tough word to even say. And there's over 80 different words for lipofuscin. I think that's the misconception that people have is that it's going to be easy to find this out. No, Adam Bergstrom had to actually dig and research this and see that it's hidden. I mean, with the Google search, you're going to get ads for omega-3 supplements to purchase. To mail that poison to your house, it's ridiculous. It's not going to show you this study called Pansteatitis of Unknown Etiology Associated with Large-Scale Nile Crocodile Mortality in Kruger National Park, South Africa. Pathological Findings, December 2013, Journal of Zoo and Wildlife Medicine. You have to dig to find that. And then you have to dig some more to find that it was actually the PUFAs that caused this yellow fat disease in the Nile crocodiles. So don't stop digging, keep learning. I'll keep sharing information like this on Mito Life Radio, and we'll figure all this out together. So enjoy the interview. Here's Adam Bergstrom. I'm here with Mr. Adam Bergstrom. Welcome back to the show. Glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Matt. Oh, yeah. Really appreciate you uh, sharing your wisdom whenever you come on the show. It's always so fun. And um, you're so sharp, you know, for eating all that sugar. (laughs) Sugar destroys the brain, right? Your memory is really good. (laughs) I now found it in 25 pound bags. (laughs) Cheaper. I mean, $13 a bag. For, uh, for 25 pounds of white sugar. And when you think of it, the white sugar is pure because it has to be just sugar. The, if you get the brown sugar, the so-called brown sugar, they really just spread uh, uh, spray caramel on it or, uh, or burn it. That's all it is, caramelization, uh, because it's illegal to have actually really brown sugar, but it can have traces of glyphosate on it. But when they have white sugar, it's so pure, it's actually better off with the white sugar in this case. And I'm a natural guy, but in this case, with sugar, I get it from C&H. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's interesting. I was just at the health food store last week, and they had, I think, fair trade certified organic brown sugar. And I bought some just to try. Um, and then they had powdered sugar, which I think had some starch with it, mm. but it's good for certain baking and stuff. But I, what I find is just the plain old white sugar. I feel the best from it tastes the best. 
And I think people are going for the minerals, right? When they get the brown sugar, it's like, I want the minerals, but yep. it's not really true. Not really. You can get it from your other food. The idea was that sugar won't burn and you have to get metabolites to burn it was the whole thing that was against sugar. And of course, it's the lactic acid, not the sugar. That's the problem. Cancer feeds on sugar. It feeds on everything, but it mostly likes other things like glutamine. It'll, go it'll gorge on that. It anything... Cancer is an isoparasite, so it eats anything we do. So that's obviously not the way to uh, kill it. You have to use other strategies to get it. And iron too, right? Because that's part of the lipofuscin thing. I know iron feeds Lyme disease and all of these infectious diseases, right? A lot of viruses. It feeds most. Uh, some of them, ironically... Uh, Lyme disease feeds on manganese. It's the only exception of the rule I know. Everything else loves iron, viruses, bacteria, and things like that. So when a person is uh, sick with a flu or a cold or a corona, then they definitely should go for uh, uh, low iron, definitely. One way to do it is vitamin C by itself will start to clear the vitamin, uh, the iron out. It chelates it out. But if you uh, take it with iron, then it reinforces it. Vitamin C plus iron, you get extra iron in your body. So you can adjust wow. it for your own use. That's fascinating. And potatoes are a great source, right? You eat a lot of those. That is it dehydroscorbic acid? Yep, amazing source. Yeah, Ray Pete's got that right, that it definitely has a type of vitamin C we don't hear about. In fact, they used to say that was the bad kind, the oxidized kind, but that's the kind we use in our bodies. And, of course, they don't measure that, so the potato doesn't have that. A lot of people don't know that uh, Dr. Kellogg of the Kellogg Center, you know, the breakfast cereal, he was more into potatoes than he was grains. Potatoes were an important part of the diary, and he raves and raves, has written a couple of books on potatoes only. Wow. I might just become a potato farmer up here in Idaho. That seems like an easy crop to it grow. It is. Idaho is famous for its potatoes. I even met the grandson of Potato Smith, the guy who started the whole thing up there. <laughs> wow. Yeah, because they don't need – I mean, light – doesn't light affect them in an interesting way? Like it will actually kind of cause – are a green they, they like go green yeah well you can get like, solanine and it's not as deadly a poison as they say but it should be avoided and you just eat them fresh some potatoes don't have that i think the yukon and others don't tend to accumulate solanine and there's a couple other chemicals related to it too but uh it but people do get poison from it it's rare that people die from it but if you eat enough of it you can't die from it so do, do you just have potatoes with butter and salt? Is that kind of butter your and salt meal? and and eggs? Usually we have like a mm -hmm. two. Uh, I have semi hard boiled, and vibrant gal just likes them a little uh, looser, and uh, and then I have a, three or four smaller potatoes. We get them. Um, several people grow it, and we found a really good source. They're delicious potatoes. So we we I really look forward to it. A lot of fresh food, the uh, the markets here, they're going to replace it with a cop shop. They're going to put the police station there because the police are more important than the farmer's market. But so they're looking for a new location. Right now, it's ideal because they let us have a business where other uh, businesses park during the weekend. On uh, Saturday, they let us park in that big parking lot there. We just walk into the market and stock up, and we do. <laughs> That's interesting because if people – had the sugar from the potatoes, there'd probably be less crime and less of a need for cops, right? <laughs> yeah, no, definitely, definitely. It has an effect on it, you know. And look at omega threes. We we can go into that later today because lipofuscin uh, and omega three fatty acids are really getting out of hand. Yeah, I just had a person send me a message yesterday, and she said that her omega three to six ratio was off. And I think people see that test and it, it brings some validity to the, to it, right? Because they think, oh, if a test exists, then it must be important. Yeah. Ever since uh, George and Mildred Burr, you know, pulled it off that it's essential. And of course, they aren't essential at all. And all they did is essentialize the omega-6s. A lot of people don't know that omega-3s didn't become officially essential until the World Health Organization declared them so in the 1990s. Wow. We know they don't have our best interests at heart. 
<laughs> Not at all. And it causes yellow fat disease. Why I can write so many books about it is because they, it, you can't find anything that ultimately always, if you take them, leads to a disease state. In fact, they hide it under various names. Look at this chart. This is completely nothing but uh, – you can't read it, but there's 45 different names for yellow fat disease here on this. From everything from uh, waxy liver disease, waxy yellow fat disease, stiff calf disease, steatitis, uh, bovine renal, renal lipofuscinosis, cumulative lipofuscinosis, embryonic death syndrome from the mother taking the, uh, the omega-3s. Uh, granulomatous theatitis, hepatic diatepsia, on and on and on with ridiculous names. But they divide it up into all of these names, so it's hard to track down that it is one disease disguised as muscular dystrophy, muscular sclerosis, Crohn's disease, Parkinson's, Lou Gehrig's, on and on and on it goes. That's amazing. Yeah, I, I get so many people reaching out to me for their symptoms and I'm very honest when I, you know, I, I've never heard of that disease. I've never heard of that condition. Like, what is it? And it's usually an itis or an osis. And I do my best to just simplify it. You know, if there's fibrosis and scar tissue or lipofuscin, a lot of the dysfunction with the hundreds or thousands of names of diseases, to me, it's just accumulation of different things. It is quite often. And often it's the same disease, only they rename it in all kinds of little, they find a gene and then make a disease out of it. When back in the day, doctors look, looked at the patient. They didn't look at a test. They could actually tap to potent and find out what was wrong with your liver better than they could with x-rays at that time or your heart or anything. Uh, we're just known to the stethoscope goes to the heart. Back then, they went all over the body with it. Interesting. Well, on the omega-3 note, um, I was listening to a prominent uh, biohacker uh, named Ben <laughs> the other day, and he, he sells a, an omega-3 supplement, and uh, he actually lives kind of near me, Spokane, Washington. And mm. he did a, a video the other day, and he's like, yeah, I consume six to eight grams of fish oil a day. And I was like, oh, no. And then he brought up Charles Poliquin, and I didn't recognize the name until I looked him up, and he was actually a a guy that died at the age of 57 that trained yeah. uh, Olympic athletes and stuff. But mm -hmm. he was recommending to his athletes like 40 to 60 grams a day sometimes. And I was wow. like, geez, that's, I mean, no wonder he died. I mean, God bless him, but he died. 57 is pretty young <laughs> to go out. You know, if some of those uh, will go out in the toilet, fortunately, because the body can't handle a lot of that. That's their only, and by the way, you can live pretty well by using them for your first, in your 20s, your 30s, and 40s. But then in the animal world, it's the most accurate uh, measurement of aging. But if you look at Wikipedia, they say it's chronological aging, but it's biological aging. And us as human beings, we can do everything from keto to total vegan. So we have a choice on how we're going to age. And with if you're going to pick omega-3, Fatty acids, it's a land creature, not in the ice cold Arctic at uh, where it gets uh, below zero, then you're in trouble. You know, even the salmon that are kept in farms get yellow fat disease quite easily because they're not under pressure in the dark and very cold. It's like your motor oil in your car, which uh, you have light motor oil when you go up in the mountains and you have heavier motor oil when you're down on the desert that makes sense what would you say like stearic acid palmitic acid and oleic acid are like generally safe and good for humans all except palmitic acid i have a real problem with uh palm oil but coconut oil has very few of it very little of it and butter has very little of it too uh, not enough to cause any damage. But palmitic acid, there is a lot of information to say it could be just as bad as omega. Well, maybe not omega-3s, but omega-6s. Interesting. Oh, wow. Yeah, I just found some really uh, authentic olive oil I'm really excited about because it's hard to find real stuff. And I like to put that on my carrot salad uh, with a little bit of salt and apple cider vinegar. 
It is good. A lot of people will get concretions in their large intestines, bezars, they call them, in different types of uh, concretions. In other words, if something like a gallstone gets through into your large intestine, it's more dangerous there than it is elsewhere. But olive oil will actually tend to dissolve that. The olive oil flushes where you get that those green stones out. It's not really gallstones. But what the olive oil does is protect you from the gallstones that go into the large intestine and small intestine. Well, the small intestine, it's the most dangerous there. I wondered at one time, how can a gallstone be more dangerous by blocking the ileocecal valve when it can get through the smaller biliary duct? And it's because they start to protect the colon starts to envelop it to protect it from the gallstone and it can get as big as a baseball and once that blocks your ileocecal valve it's called death interesting wow um i I had a question about uh coffee enemas the other day my friend was asking me if i still do them and what i think of them i i used to do them daily and i think that's way overkill and so i stopped i haven't done one in years um do you think those are beneficial for, for longevity just for the, I mean, maybe just the coffee aspect, but I think you've said in previous interviews, Orly does the same thing, right? <laughs> pretty, pretty much the same thing. Now, sometimes uh, if a person was really sick or had a problem, perhaps there'd be a reason for it. It's not totally, uh, it does help to uh, uh, release the intestines and we can actually drink coffee through the colon. It will absorb. It's one of the things that will go in there. Another thing ironically is peanut butter but uh, we don't want to take peanut butter. (laughs) What do you, what do you think about Rishi spore oil? Before the interview, I had a friend, my friend William reached out and said that killed his libido, like his sex drive. And I had never taken large enough amounts of Rishi spore oil, but I found a study where it said it's pretty much like 50% oleic acid and like 10 to 15% linoleic acid, which isn't good. So maybe that linoleic acid kind of killed his libido. (laughs) It could be. uh, I'm not sure about that. But I'll tell you one thing. The interesting thing is I've never found a single case of yellow fat disease from omega-6 oils. It's always omega-3 oils, which is interesting. Now, I don't take – I I walk big circles around omega-3s too. You you can only minimize it. There are going to be some there obviously in everything. But – I just ne- have never have found a case of it, and neither has Monsanto, because Monsanto has been fighting yellow fat disease on the sly since the 1960s, and people don't know that. There still are with the Vista uh, soybean. However, they tried to be honest and do it actually naturally, and now uh, DuPont is the one that's spreading the lipo, uh, the omega-3 fighting uh, soybean. <laughs> Because soybeans had enough of the the small amount of linolenic acid. They're clever. They call it linolenic because people don't know the difference. You remember the first time you interviewed me, I didn't even know which was which. It was, it was the omega-3. I remember it now by N for no. And linolenic acid is omega-3. So when, when uh, the Vista of Soybean came out, I read the biotech books and the journals, and they didn't even know the difference. They thought Monsanto was taking out the omega-6 fatty acids, but they were taking the omega-3s out because it was clogging restaurant machinery, and it was causing yellow fat disease at fish farms. So they took out the omega-3s and reduced them down to lower. There's still plenty of omega-6s. They don't cause yellow fat disease anymore, at least not as readily. They slow it down, Uh, but omega-6s really don't cause it. They cause other things. I, I uh, still, but I can't. I can't write a single book about it. <laughs> it it's ethoxyquin, right? Is that the synthetic vitamin E they're using to try to fight it? One of them. They actually use uh, four. There's a uh, uh, BTA, uh, BHT, no, BHA, BHT. I see. I actually have written written down here someplace. Oh yeah, here we go. Ethoxyquin is a Monsanto original product marketed as Santaquin. Then you have propylgalate, BHT, BHA, and TEHQ for tert butyl hydroxyquinone, and uh, and they're pretty much toxic. They also did use. Uh, something called hydrazine at one time, written about uh, in Life Extension by the Pierce, by Dirk Pearson and Sandy Shaw. Uh, but 
they have side effects and they are not like natural vitamin E. Uh, and uh, but the coat, the when you transfer fish meal or fish oil products across the ocean, you are required to put one of those chemicals I just mentioned, usually ethoxyquin, in the fish meal or the fish oil to keep the ships from exploding. You can't make this stuff up. Check it out. It's all over the internet. I have many cases of it in the, in the books that are written about yellow fat disease. Well, I was just I was at Home Depot last week, and in the barbecue section, uh, the the charcoal fire starter, the liquid, they sell vegetable oil now at Home Depot, and it's you know it's yellow. It looks exactly like fish oil or algae oil. Uh, it probably is algae oil. And Interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. They uh, they're well, they figured out ways to make it kind of like artificial fish these days. So uh, they're always out to market. And by the way, the danger now is why they have uh, increased it is that the farm there's actually it's supposed to be two point two billion. It's something like forty billion dollars made a year on fish oil products and fish oils. They're lying about it. And you can go to the actual sources of the corporations and cartels that are joined together to promote it. Well, all that money, the big pharma finally found out they only have two uh, of their own pharmaceutical grades of EPA and DHA. And so they decided they're missing out. There are now 88 drugs incorporating EPA and DHA in the pipeline, ready to be approved by the FDA, who at one point said, this is nonsense. This doesn't really do anything. And now they've been paid enough money. They even admit it on their sites that they're paying money to uh, to remove the litigation against EPA and DHA. Again, you can't make this stuff up. That's insane. And what's what's crazy to me is a lot of the prominent speakers, I've seen you put lists on, on Facebook about it, they're all promoting omega-3s. And these are big names in the health community that are doing lectures and seminars and webinars and people just trust it. So what I try to educate people on is like safe supplements to take, like niacinamide, vitamin E. There's certain ones that it's really hard to do damage. I mean, you'd have to like stay on the whole bottle or something. <laughs> Well, uh, uh, vitamin E can be taken in large amounts if it's elevated slowly and then released slowly because there is a slight danger of an embolism if you go up to like 10,000 or something. But otherwise, you can take quite a lot of vitamin E uh, with no problem at all. Uh, it is one of the safest supplements out there, one of the few safe supplements out there. And so I've got no problem with people taking it, and it does give protection against uh, lipofuscin accumulation. Uh, I was taught by my mentor that that vitamin E, that selenium, or vitamin E is actually chelated selenium. And you'll find they work together. So even if it isn't really a chelated selenium, it certainly works so. And they even use selenium in fish farms along with vitamin E and the ethoxyquin. <laughs> They're taking no chances. Uh, that's really interesting because I, I just came out with like a desiccated oyster product. And um, I know there's there's kind of back and forth. I know Ray Pete like talked down about desiccated liver recently because that's blowing up. But uh, I've seen people's like iron panels shift for the positive, like their copper status went up and their active ceruloplasmin status without even eating actual liver, which I, I always say real oysters, real liver, you know, right. before supplementing is always best. And there's the water in there, right? So that changes things. Yeah, yeah red light can uh, raise copper levels too. That's one of the things I was, uh, when I first started listening to Ray Pete. So we have our chicken lamp here uh, on quite often. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, I'm trying to get my uh, my chickens and my goats on that because now that we're getting into the winter, we have probably heading to high 20s, you know, high 20s Fahrenheit. So got to keep them uh, charged up. <laughs> red light is very powerful and, and people have mistaken. It. It's not the infrared part. The infrared does the minor part. The real part of the red light is the orange, the red orange, the red, the uh, so-called deep red. And that's the that's the actual therapeutic part. The color in this case works better for your copper 
than does the actual infrared. Now, if you want the infrared, you get really close within like 12 or 16 inches of it. When you feel the heat, you're getting infrared. If you don't feel the heat and you just see the light, like ours is about 10 feet away from us often, we just leave it on and take the red light. That's cool. Um, I want to ask you about type one diabetes because I get questions about this quite often. Like when I talk about how sugar is a, is a solution for diabetes and, you know, vitamin E can help with it. And anything that reduces like free fatty acids circulating in the bloodstream will help with glucose uptake. But um, it's, it's still a pancreas issue, right? It's like, um, I think you, the pancreas can't make insulin. If it's type one. Yeah. Definitely. And they used to think that it was a sugar wasting disease. And when they labeled that, they figured all you have to do is cut down on sugar. But what they didn't factor in is that guess where the sugar comes from then? It eats your muscles away to get the sugar. Uh, I forget the chemical name of the process, but basically you turn protein into sugar because your body's desperate. So my father had type 1 diabetes and he basically died by going on a keto diet. He only made it to 54, and I had no idea about sugar then. I believed that. I didn't. I used sugar. They'd say, your father has diabetes, and you're using sugar? I would go to a Chinese restaurant and uh, freak out people by taking my Chinese tea in a little cup, half sugar, half tea, and drink about 10 of them. I never had any effect of it. But then I got guilted in the 60s or 70s. Oh, sugar's bad. So I started trying to cut down. I ate a few candy bars, but I was behaving myself. And then finally, when I heard Pete, I said, this is ridiculous because if you research it, it it's the cure for bed sores, all kinds of things, and sugar diabetes. Because what William Budd did so long ago, and a Frenchman whose name I can't uh, remember, that they're two separate countries discovered simultaneously before the Civil War. Basically, they give their patients – they realize if you're breaking down muscle tissue – what you do is you you measure how much is coming out. You don't go above that level. So if this was adopted in hospitals, there'd be no deaths. It's not a cure, but you don't eat your muscles away and die and go blind and get macular degeneration and everything. And of course, involved with macular de degeneration, there is lipofuscin. It's called drusen. And drusen is lipofuscin in disguise, and it always leads to macular degeneration. Yeah. Um, when I spoke with Justin on this show, I, I was talking about Stargardt's disease and it's a very rare one, but that's another lipofuscin disease. Like you said, there's a million names for it. It's so funny. I think I have about 50. That is a genetic name, supposedly. I'm not really believing it, but there's about 50 of those. And if you approach a doctor, they say, oh, lipofuscin diseases are genetic. The others are normal aging. Well, I'm not for normal aging. If you can control the extra years you get and your health, and be mobile. In other words, uh, uh, die old at uh, no, no, die young at a very old age. Uh, that's pretty good uh, goings, I think. Yeah, and for me, for me recently, especially with this whole election and the whole COVID thing, I've realized that it's really been stressing people out. Like I've just been watching this year, just people fighting each other on social media and cussing and just very angry. And it kind of made me look at myself and my stress level and realize like, hey, if I'm wanting to live a long time biologically, uh, not because I'm afraid of death, but just for fun, then I should keep my stress low. And so it's been helpful to like see these examples of people that are just getting, because I think that's their whole plan to stress us out to death, right? I mean, that seems like a very easy way to kill people. <laughs> that's that's what I believe. I, I won't go on because of the uh, the platform deplatforming about why, but yeah, they they wish us to be stressed and split, divided we fall. The old saying, uh, "United we stand," and of course, uh, people are divided now and divided. And so many red herrings are out there. God, that's a fish, isn't it? Red herrings are out there dragging around that people don't realize what's really happening is that globalism is happening right under our feet. All the organizations, most of the global organizations are right in our own country in the United States, and you can look them up. They list them where they are. I know who the representative is for Davos right here in Santa Barbara. There's one for Austin. There's one for Bellingham, Washington. You can look up any town and find out who it is. It's These are local people 
working with Switzerland. They they hire a guy like Schwab, and he's got a foreign accent, so they think it's coming from there to here. No, it's here. And Carl Schwab didn't even write those books. They were ghostwritten by someone else. People have no idea what's going on here. <laughs> wow. Yeah, for me, from my research, it goes comes down to like Rothschild Zionism, I think is the best description of what's controlling the U.S. And um, I mean, that goes way, way back. But it's just, uh, yeah, it's funny to see people fighting each other. I think we would be better if we focused on our health, because if we were less stressed, if we ate sugar, then we wouldn't be fighting as much. <laughs> That's kind of what I go to. True. And now the techies have become the billionaires. They're the ones running the world. Bezos, Gates, those people are making fortunes. And they want it, they want to consolidate it all into giant corporations. Teddy Roosevelt, uh, he was a bit of a corpus himself, but he took care of the competition. He divided Standard Oil into like 30 companies. If you look closely now, all of those have come back together slowly and surely, where there's about three or four oil companies, and they were the original split up standard oil companies. So, but then uh, Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos have more power now because now with surveillance, you can't get away from them. If you didn't want to be part of the oil cartels with the Rockefeller, buy a horse and a wagon and go west. You could get away. There were places to go. Now they even deliberately, as Edward Abbey has pointed out, have paved all the national parks. So you can't have like that guy in uh, upper Washington state who hijacked a plane, took a bunch of money and jumped into the forest and they never found him again. He got away. There's no paving. If you go up to Mount Baker there in uh, Washington State, there's signs. If you wander off the trail, consider yourself dead. We can't find you. That was used to be up there. It used to freak me out. So we stayed to the trail. But in most parks, Yosemite, places like that, they have all these paved roads to make sure they can get tanks in there in case you're going to try what Castro did out in the forest without any roads. Worked for him. They don't want any gorillas in the United States messing things up. That's so crazy. Well, since you brought up Amazon, um, I was just reading this morning that Jeff Bezos, I guess, is in a little fight with Elon Musk because uh, Elon Musk, you know, has SpaceX and he just sent up something to the International Space Station. And I guess they're both trying to fight for real estate in space as far as satellite satellites uh, orbiting the Earth. And so uh, I thought that was interesting. I think I, the article said that they could clash their orbital uh paths would collide and so there can only be one you know kind of <laughs> oh, like the highlander right <laughs> yeah that's the, the plan in fact we felt the sonic boom from elon musk's thing going up we're near to vandenberg here and vandenberg has been bought by a bunch of very rich billionaires they have a private section there and a lot of that is so they can escape. Their idea is to escape when all heck breaks loose on the earth. Uh, right now, they don't have the capacity to do that. I mean, how are they going to live out there except for limited amounts of time? But that's what they're doing. They have life extension people here who know the truth about life extension. And they're also bought that property at Vandenberg. It's privately owned now, a section of Vandenberg. Wow. Yeah. The only movies I like to watch are futuristic movies and your movie suggestions have always been awesome. But you give me my <laughs> Elysium was one of those where they had like the, the circle space station that all the rich people were living on. Right. And, um, I think it was Matt Damon and he like kind of tried to save earth or something. And I think they're kind of predictive programming, right. With that. But I've also heard about the dumbs, like the deep underground military bunkers. I heard about that like 10 years ago. Where there's they like have, these large tunnels connect, connecting. They have lots of them. And uh, right away they had restrictions on uh, at uh, Mount Weather and uh, what's the one in Colorado, the, the big base there. Those are all uh, being armed for this crisis. Why would they be arming those places for this crisis unless they knew something? That was in the news in February of this year. Wow. Yeah, it's freaky. I mean, I feel safer kind of at higher elevation out of the city. It still blows my mind that people live deep in the city because all these like Gwen Towers coming up and the palm tree setups and right next to schools and churches. I mean, it's getting scary. 
<laughs> oh, definitely. The uh, it, well, I can't mention that kind of a phone system, but there's a certain one that's a faux type that doesn't really bother you. But the real type of these type of wireless phone systems, they can't affect you. And if you're in an apartment building where they have one of those trees or right next door in the city, you're cooked. Out in the country where you can be hundreds of feet away from it, you're pretty safe from all of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I've been I've been messing around. I got like three different brands of uh shielding clothing, like silver embedded, which is interesting. And uh like sweatshirts and stuff. And I have a little RF meter. It's like four hundred bucks, like a pretty decent one with the big antenna off the top. And I put it under my sweatshirt and it got quiet, you know, because it has the sound feature. So wow. those silver embedded things definitely block. Um, I just don't know. People have asked me, oh, if the EMF gets in one of the holes, does it bounce around for a while? I, like, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's a question of degree. You're going to, you, we, our body is meant to take a certain amount of uh, poisons, a certain amount of toxins, a certain amount of abuse, but then the liver gets overloaded, the heart gets overloaded, you can't take it. So you have to know your level of stress. And by the way, sugar. If I get in stress where I realize I'm stressed, I go take a teaspoon of sugar. It's the best thing to do it. Even Ray Pete, they go take milk and sugar is one of his solutions. That even works better because you get it to stick around a little longer. You got it right there. Yeah. <laughs> it's a stress uh, reliever. That makes sense. Yeah. I, I really feel it. And um, yeah, I know that magnesium too kind of acts as a Faraday cage because I think when we're stressed, calcium and iron flood into the cell, right? And so there are certain nutrients we could have, like coffee would be really beneficial to protect against that, right? They, they balance each other out. In fact, a lot of people don't realize that the periodic table of the elements, uh, people know what it looks like, so I don't really have to show it, but they're balanced. Each one is odd, even, odd, even, acid, alkaline, anabolic, catabolic. They work that way, but nobody taught me that in chemistry. I got a D minus in chemistry, barely got through it. It was so boring. But now I'm fascinated with it because they didn't tell us the story of how each of those levels is layered in the body so that in your bloodstream, for instance, the blood cells are all right along the, uh, what do you call it, the fourth period of the table of the elements. Iron is there. It's right next to manganese, which you need for your blood cell. It's right next to uh, cobalt. That's a B12 with there. And if you look at lobster blood, which has copper as its center, not iron on a lobster, uh, that's why lobster is such a good uh, source of uh, copper. They use cuproglobin, not hemoglobin. And the C-squirt on that same chart, number 22, uh, uses uh, vanadium as the center of its, uh, whatever you would call it, veneta globin or something. So all that level is the blood cell. If you go above to magnesium, that is essential for the protection of the, uh, of the uh, extracellular fluids, including blood plasma, etc. And People often don't get that straight, that uh, you need mag magnesium in the plasma and you need calcium, which happens to be in the cell. And when they get mixed up and turmoiled, uh, then they're, it's like uh, getting mixed up about your garden versus your inside in your bedroom. You don't want your garden plants in your bedroom necessarily, and you don't want your to be outside at night when it's raining. And uh, people get mixed up about that. So Emmanuel Ravisi did excellent work on that. I wrote several books about that, and he's got his uh, PDF version of uh, his uh, Rubisi textbook is all you have to put on the internet. And the whole thing is laid out there for people to see how that works. Interesting. Um, a couple things came up there. I, I think you know my friend Chad Kimball. He's on Facebook and he loves your stuff. And Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I think he's a big fan of like the Rife, Lakowski, Tesla, all that stuff. And I remember um, years ago, I don't know if he's still doing it. He was eating frequencies of nutrients. <laughs> and I was like, back then I was like, I don't know if that's going to work, but have you mm. ever heard of that? Like, I think in Sedona, Arizona, once I went to someone's, they had a whole room where they had this machine and it kind of gave me a headache, but it was putting off these frequencies that would, I mean, cause each element on the periodic table resonates at a certain frequency. Right. Uh, but the idea is you could like consume them just with energy <laughs> from like a machine. 
<laughs> you know, the, the only person I that I trusted that knew how to do that and worked out the frequency was Emmanuel Ravisi, the same person. Because, and he didn't really go into it. But what he did, there is a certain chemical that gives you cancer no matter what. Uh, if you uh, if you inject it, it always gives 100% cancer. Well, he got its spectrum. Like Dinshaw Gaudiali, these color therapists take single colors. He got its actually, uh, what do you call it, the uh, Franzheiser lines, you know, the black, white, all that kind of stuff in colors, how they found helium on the sun 25 years before they knew it was on Earth. That's why they named it after the sun. And they didn't name it as a metal uh, uh, because they, uh, well, they, uh, anyway, they got mixed up on what it was, but, uh, because of that, uh, you can actually, uh, 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 golly, you know what? I lost our subject there. I got so, and he mounted his horse and he rode off in all directions. <laughs> Jeez. Well, well, I haven't looked into Emmanuel Ravishi yet. Um, I think you've posted, I mean, his book is online for free, right? I think you mentioned that in the, the past episode. Yep. And now I remember where I was going. <laughs> the Franz Hauer's lines have a certain pattern. Well, he reasoned that if this drug had a pattern, he could just find a chemical that has its exact inverse emitter transmit and would neutralize. And indeed, only uh, about 60% of the mice were now dying from that chemical, which was totally 100% fatal. So, Wow. I wonder if that's how red light protects against like radiation damage. Is kind of it it could, but imagine they could actually work out the exact Franzhauser uh, frequencies of something, of every chemical. It's with wow. computers now that would be easy. Rubisi was doing it in the 50s and the 1950s. Why can't they do it with supercomputers today? That was like 70 years ago he was doing it. And and wow. I was amazed when I saw that because I realized the future of medicine. I'd studied color therapy and Dinshaw Gaudiali, a whole bunch of other therapies, trauma related to uh, uh, to color. And Ravisi had an answer right there in both his textbook, I think he mentions it, but one of his uh, doctors that uh, associated with him was the one that, uh, that, uh, dis- that also wrote about it more extensively. By the way, a friend of mine went to the doctor, to Dr. Ravisi, while he was still alive. He lived 101. It was pretty much functional the whole time. Uh, and uh, she got another doctor to treat her because she had AIDS and uh, you know, Rubisi had worked that out the, the year that it came out. And anyway, she's there and she had, I, I, through the iris, you can actually tell certain things, not pop iridology, but actually there is an iris analysis where you can tell something. And I saw something in the eye that showed that she could have pancreatitis. Well, she did get it. And uh, she had a serious case and they put her on drugs, a bunch of drugs. When she went to Ravisi's, uh, that doctor told her, you know, you could have stopped that pancreatic attack right away, a heaping teaspoon of white sugar. Wow. So I've known about white sugar for a long time. <laughs> why, why is that? Because it, it um, I mean, the pancreas doesn't like PUFAs and it loves sugar. Is that kind of the basic idea? <laughs> That's it. And if they're blaming the wrong thing, they're blaming the sugar. Now, I'm not saying if you eat a whole bunch of sugar, like gobble it up. Uh, I eat a lot. I'm an experiment right now, but I'm, I'm feeling no effects and I'm getting beneficial effects out of it so far. And remember, I ate it uh, when I was younger. I ate lots of sugar. But I preferred the white sugar. <laughs> Ironically, I didn't eat that many uh, candy bars. I preferred olives and pickles and the sour foods. But when it came to sugar, pour it in the tea and pour it in other things. I, I couldn't drink tea without sugar. <laughs> and so I, uh, I drank a lot of it that way, just plain white sugar. That's funny. Yeah, I, I loved uh, red vines growing up, Sour Patch Kids, uh all the, uh, I can't remember all the different names for all the candies, but it was kind of like the 90s candies. So I, I was definitely getting the white sugar, the sucrose, but I was also getting slammed with the chemicals. So I think yeah. that's why I went heavy on the sauna when I discovered health for several years <laughs> to try to sweat all that all that out. Oh, yeah. In the in the fourth grade at Halloween, I lived in a where there were a bunch of apartments. Man, 
we had to make multiple trips to get all that candy. And we stuffed ourselves. Even on Easter, it was a chocolate bunny that big. I ate half a bunny in one day. So <laughs> so I didn't have diabetes, but my, my dad did. And because they put him on a sugar-free diet, basically, it, he, he ate a lot of protein. He had to eat immense amounts of protein to survive. And so he made some sugar out of that to protect his muscles. It was protein sparing, but he didn't have enough. So he went blind and then his kidneys failed at 54. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, I know I've had Morley on the, on the podcast several times, Morley Robbins, and he's anti-sugar, <laughs> which, you know, I, I guess it's, we all have our own journey, but in the context of iron overload and iron poisoning, he was saying that sugar does not pl play well with iron. And mm. um, we had an episode with it, but have you studied like sugar's reaction with, with iron? Because I would imagine it only helps the situation by increasing the metabolic rate and then helping the detoxification process. I would, th I would think it did. And the evidence seems to point that way because uh, I first found out about uh, sugar, uh, again, through uh, various cases, nurses used to use it. In the old books, particularly, they used it, and they said it was better than anything they had. But then when they had drugs to stop infections, there's more money in that. So I would read Nursing Times from England. I one time had uh, 10 years of 52 issues per year to go through. And they would talk about, what about uh, sugar? I heard that it did this and that. Oh, yeah, it makes the medicine go down, but I don't think that has any validity. Well, they, Johns Hopkins, a whole place, a bunch of places did tests on how sugar was actually one of the best, uh, uh, actually like an antibiotic or anti-inflammatory. That's the word, anti-inflammatory. And so it actually works to help cancer. Ray Pete has actually uh, has a couple of examples of people who took large amounts of sugar and cured cancer. They've misinterpreted uh, Otto Warburg's work. He said lactic acid. He didn't say sugar. And even the modern neo-Warburgians say that amino acids and proteins are involved. And they're involved more in, we rename glycation, age, you know, uh, advanced glycation, the byproducts and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's named glycation and people think, oh, it's sugar. Well, it's mostly proteins and fats lipofuscin particularly generates out of omega-3 fatty acids. Yeah, I heard uh, Dr. Ray Pete say that the main problem with PUFAs is that they alter proteins because that PUFAs have a lot of effects, immunosuppressive, suppressing the, meta the metabolic rate. But uh, he was saying the main thing is that they actually alter proteins, which is a big deal because that's like our DNA, right? I mean, our neurotransmitters, so many things. <laughs> and even, uh, you know, a person that I, I don't really subscribe to is Brian Peskin, but he does get the fish oil thing right. And he knows that the small amounts of oils are what controls those proteins. So it actually is a lipid fraction that does the damage. And there we are again. So he's right about that. He j And by the way, he even believes, he believes omega-3 is uh, you, that, that the DHA and EPA are not essential because you can make them in your own body from ALAs. But he's but he's into the fact that you should have uh, one to eleven. In other words, much less. He said you're overtoxifying yourself by taking a fish oil uh, pill by six hundred to one and damaging yourself. So I agree with him on that. He, of course, is anti-sugar and a whole bunch of other things too. And I disagree with most everything else he says about his. Uh, what uh, his PERs, whatever he calls his oils that are essential and things like that. But otherwise, he certainly knows that fish oil is bad for you. Yeah, the fat for fuel thing is so seductive because I was under that spell for so long and I was intermittent fasting, caloric restricting and using stevia and my coffee and doing the whole deal while taking PUFAs. And I eventually just felt like my nervous system fell apart. And, uh, Finding Ray Pete's work and getting into your work, I actually felt like I re started to rebuild my nervous system over the past two years. Yeah. You know, I, I'd never heard of yellow fat disease until I heard Ray Pete mention it. But I also was familiar that Emmanuel Rubisi said, if you take uh, omega-3 oils over a more than six weeks, 
you you got a counter reaction from your adrenals to defend against them. And I wondered, why were you to defend against them? So I bought into cod liver oil was good for you. But whenever I bought a bottle, I never took it more than three weeks at a time. And so I would throw away most of my cod liver oil. I left a trail of, of one-third used cod liver oils behind me because I knew that about Rubisi. So when I heard uh, Ray Pete talk about omega-3s being bad, I already knew about that. But I never looked up yellow fat disease. And one day after hearing him talk about it for a year, I just happened to open up a page to see what it was. And look what happened. In fact, your interview uh, with Justin on Extreme Health Radio, uh, you mistakenly said I wrote 11 books when I only wrote 10. And I promised not to write a ninth. I promised not to have 10. But when you said that, I said, heck, I'll write an 11th book since they said so. <laughs> and so I started it. And uh, just recently, I was on Justin's show again. And suddenly all this information fell in my lap. So I finished up the book about the time I was on that show. And they have started a 12 since I found out what the drug companies are planning and a whole bunch of other things. Look at Geronimo. Their religion, the Apaches, regarded fish as the devil, basically. You don't eat fish. He never ate a fish in his entire life. He was a super warrior. You couldn't kill him. He got shot. He got wounded. He got arrows. He got clubbed unconscious, left for dead. He woke up. He was a drunkard. He drank all kinds of alcohol, never touched fish, even through the reservation and all the traumas he went through. He finally died at 80 when he got drunk out of his mind, fell off his horse in the rain and got pneumonia from lying in the rain all night in Oklahoma or wherever he was. So, But he never ate fish. The, the Navajos don't eat it either. It's against their religion. Now they're starting to do it. Though they joke, you don't try and open a fish restaurant in Navajo territory. And also the... Uh, What is the other tribe? Uh, uh, The Zunis. Maybe it's the Zunis. It's another tribe. Definitely anti-fish for different reasons. But the Apaches wouldn't even take a waterfowl because they might have eaten a fish or something that came out of – or a frog. They didn't believe any of that was worthy. And they wouldn't even eat a bear because they would eat fish sometimes. (laughs) That's fascinating. Yeah, seafood makes the most sense to get the minerals, right? Like selenium and copper and maybe some zinc, but very sparingly, you know, some oysters here and there, or some clams. But I think pescatarian diet, um, I always reference Jack Cruz and I, I post pictures of him just, you know, I don't, not as to be mean, but just to show the progression of not eat, because he doesn't take omega 3 supplements, but just sunlight and a pescatarian diet, what that does. And yeah. just tons of age spots all over. It's even on his neck now and going on his upper body, like everywhere. You know, they appear where they're stressed. So a person out in the sun is going to get them. So they can mistake it. Oh, that's because of the sun. But actually, if your liver gets under stress, say you take alcohol and you've already had the omega-3s in there, guess what happens? It becomes age spots. Age spots in the liver. In fact, one of the diseases on my long list there is shrunken heart disease. What happens at first, it swells up and shrinks down, and they knew about this before the Civil War. When they even knew that cod liver oil could cause it. (laughs) So so people think it's so innocent. And cod liver oil is a little better if you're starving to death and can't get vitamin A and D, which you can if you really know what you're doing, even in England in foggy climates. uh, Then there's a case for it to take some just to get uh, some vitamin A and D. But there's many other ways to get those uh, vitamins. So, so I have red wine occasionally, just one glass. I don't crave any more than that. And it's a really small glass, but it alcohol acts differently in a PUFA laden liver versus one that's kind of depleted of PUFAs, right? Yep. Alcohol is not going to hurt your liver that much. I've seen research on it. If you don't have PUFAs, but if you have PUFAs, then, then you get what's called non, even non fatty, uh, uh, Non-fatty liver disease is actually, that's a yellow fat disease. Uh, The other one, when you take it, you activate it. But even though it's alcoholic uh, fatty liver, it's caused, uh, well, it has a lot to do. It's contributory in that point. Both of them together, you get serious problems. But too much alcohol, of course, is is harmful. But a glass of wine... uh, one time a lady came into a health food store I managed, and she had uh, nephrosis of the liver, I think, necrosis of the, of, of, the, of the kidney. 
And so she wanted to know a supplement. And I said, go over to the liquor store and buy a bottle of red wine. And she said, what? I come into a health food store. You tell me to go to a liquor store. And I said, take it between five to seven o'clock, which is kidney time. Your kidneys are most active at that time. Your grip strength is stronger which you get through the kidneys and like a battery. Kidneys work like a battery. So I told her to take it at that time. And she says, you know, it's funny. When I come home from work, that's when I take, I do take a little glass of wine and my pain goes away. (laughs) So if you're going to take wine, the best place, if it's a grape wine or a champagne or something like that, the best time is from six to seven in the evening, local mean time, sundial time, not banker's time, which can be, Anything they want to make it is off as much as two hours sometimes. Interesting. So what? What's the? What was the first time you mentioned? Not a green. So it's not your. You're like I'm in Pacific Standard, so it'd be different from that. Yeah. Well, you, you actually have to see the local uh, time. Like we have a. We're on SunSync on our pay site. We actually have a place to figure, but you can figure it other ways. And usually, uh, the old way you could get. See, astrologers need the exact time you're born sun time. So I used to use those books for my purposes because it would tell you how much it was off in each town pretty much. It varies this way and that way, but that's not important. Like here in Santa Barbara, we're only off about five minutes in time. But if we go to Bakersfield, it's going to be 15 minutes. And if you're right, it's a line. It can be 55 minutes different. Plus, you get daylight saving time where they fudge an extra hour over you. And during the Second World War, they had wartime, two hours off. And supposedly, it's like uh, the joke about the old Indian, white men are funny. They say that you you cut off one foot of blanket on the bottom and sew it on the top, and you have more blanket. <laughs> yeah, I heard that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I've heard Ray say if you rub alcohol on age spots, they'll actually fade. And I think he said even vitamin E and progesterone have done it. But alcohol sounds like the most affordable way to do it. Yeah, he, <laughs> sa- he said if, it, if you catch them early enough, you can get them. But the, the other ones he said are hard to get off. But if, if you first see them forming, then put gin. Uh, gin is probably one of the purest alcohols on it. In fact, gin can actually help your liver. Uh, There's a case of, amazing, this was on the History Channel. Two bootleggers who had a cigarette boat were chased by uh, the feds, and they shot them full of holes. So they both hid the boat and went to a cabin, and they had friends there helping them because they thought they were going to die. One especially, there was no chance he was going to live, and the other one. So they decided, let's get drunk before before we die. They both, the gin cured them. So wow. in, in exception, now I, I think if they had kept doing it, then they're going to get all the problems out of it. But it actually acted as a tonic to them. Maybe it's called uh, what do they call that? The uh, uh, they have a they have a hormesis, I think is the word that they're using for homeopathy or isopathy, where they uh, do it. But anyway, who knows? It worked for them. <laughs> it's interesting how people tend to pair like a cigar with like bourbon. Right, it like goes together. <laughs> now that's where a lot of the statistics get mixed up. One person that takes something tends to go to the other, and so then one gets blamed, and it's really the other that causes the damage. Yeah. Interesting. Um, have you heard of like? Because I I've been looking for solutions, and I think you said the other day I listened to you on uh, Justin's show, Extreme Health Radio, and um. You were saying the Beaker Boys are trying to figure out the the cure for lipofuscin, and you said watch out because it's going to be like a pharma kind of solution. I Mole- heard like, go sorry, good <laughs> molecular face lifts. They want to go into each cell with a nano laser and suck it out of each cell. Now we're like, how many trillions of cells that we have in our body? It's the most ridiculous thing. But they've snowed the public. Come to us, and we're going to suck the little lipofuscans out of every cell in your body it's absolute nonsense (laughs) but that's what they're doing they're promoting it now because rather than stop eating the thing that causes the lipofuscan oh get it all over because we can just take it out and do a molecular facelift with nano lasers and certain dna drugs that go in and and farm it out of there yeah it's it's absolute nonsense (laughs) 
Wow, interesting. That's like the procedure where they uh, remove fat from people. What's it called? Lipo. Yeah, uh, they, exactly. <laughs> except they're doing it on a nano level. It's it's ridiculous when you think about it. Some of these things, if you really just sit back and think about it, now wait a minute, what the heck are they doing here? You know. But have yeah. you ever heard of anyone, by the way, that did the liposuction thing? Because a woman asked me if that's harmful the other day, and I didn't know. I, I don't think it is. I've never heard, but. The molecular facelifts, I think they're just starting to experiment with that. I don't think it's been approved by the FDA, but it's a matter of time. It's well, I mean, got... where it's like a like a person with extra weight on their stomach and that with surgery, they pull out the fat. Oh, yeah, I have. It... Uh, and <laughs> only one of them seems to have kept the fat off. The other one yeah. seemed to grow it back right away. And then you're you're damaged by missing part of your intestines which are very important. See, they think, oh, you can get by with a section here and a section there. If you really have to, yes, but mostly that doesn't work. The thing is, monitor what goes in the mouth. Even, uh, I'm not a proponent of all raw foods, but in a raw food, it's hard to gain weight on raw foods if you eat salads. So a person like that would be better off eating eating salads. For most people, though, once your metabolism is, is up, you can eat just about anything you want to. It's best to eat whole foods with dietary. See, dietary fiber slows or the breaks for sugar. So is fat. So Ray Pete says milk and fat it makes the sugar stay in longer and raise it, keeps the glycemic index from going up. And dietary fiber in a fruit, they all have them. That's why you don't mix it in. When you take oat fiber and wheat fiber, you actually can cause damage to the intestines. Uh, sometimes I used to use a tiny amount. But again, when I started recommending oat fiber, when I was mistakenly uh, uh, enamored of it, because, oh, this is water soluble, not like wheat fiber, so it can't cause any problem. I told my mentor, Adana Lay, about it, and he looked at me and said, be my guest. And I knew that meant, so I argued about the, uh, the water soluble. Well, within six months, there was a, a, a case of a guy who ate oat bran and had to have intestinal surgery for it. And by six, by the end of the year, there were most, so many cases that doctors were warning. If you take oat bran, take it with two eight ounce glasses of water and never take more than a half cup because we're having so, we're flooded with surgeries for oat bran. But, but if you get the bran in the fruit, like a kiwi is 25% bran, so is a prune. Others are five or 6%. They're, designed to handle the sugar load so you have all these options when you eat a whole food it's all packed together uh you can't go wrong except for white sugar doesn't seem to hurt me but i eat fruit and other things that balance them out too i don't just live on sugar all day <laughs> not like a hummingbird yeah right. I... <laughs> or a butterfly <laughs> Yeah, I noticed if I do, like I was doing 50 ounces of bone broth a day. I'm still kind of averaging there. Um, I was doing like a half gallon of milk, you know, a quart of orange juice, and then a lot of coffee. And it, at some point I was like, dang, I'm kind of like a liquidarian again. <laughs> and then when I realized that, <laughs> my stools were super loose. And so I've been increasing my fiber ever since then. And I find even if I eat, you know, one or two or three raw carrots a day, that's a really gentle fiber. And I, we get local pretty much biodynamic carrots up here. And so, and, you know, all the root vegetables in Idaho are awesome. But um, yeah, I find just having the raw carrot really helps to add that bulk. And then if occasionally I'll do psyllium, uh, psyllium husk as well. I'd be careful of psyllium. As a colonic sure. therapist, I've had, we were warned in colonic school in Arizona uh, to avoid psyllium because it causes all kinds of intestinal problems. You know, it was first designed by Big Pharma, Metamucil, and then it became a health food type of thing. But psyllium, I had a guy one time, man, it came out like uh, like lumps of stuff. I had to get him off the colonic machine, put him on the toilet, back on the colonic machine, back on the toilet, back on the colonic machine, because I was using one with a pipe you put in the person's butt, not the kind where you put a, a little... Uh, 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 what do you call it, speculum up and then everything comes out in the toilet. Well, well, uh, psyllium can cause that problem. If you have a perfect museum colon, and by the way, I took x-rays of them. I only saw one man with that. Even my own one, I took an x-ray of it, had it dropped. My, my uh, transverse colon was below my belly button in, in relation to my abdomen. So 
uh, there is no museum colon. And people that have a perfect colon like that, the psyllium goes right through. So it's actually mm. not uh, the highest choice uh, on that. What would you recommend is like, because we don't get, I guess I could just eat it and get non-local fruit. I don't like doing that. So I guess I've been trying to resist that. Maybe I'm brainwashed with the quantum health local seasonal idea. I don't know how much that matters, but um, is there any like fiber supplement you recommend? Or? You know, it's it's better to get uh, to get local food 80%. But think of what happened in Wisconsin. They ate locally and 50, no, let's see. 49% of the population got a big goiter in their neck because there's no iodine in that state. Uh-huh. And see, so sometimes you have to, you have to watch like another, another problem with selenium. Cows that eat uh, sel- the uh, grass or, or graze in South Dakota die of selenium poisoning. Cows in Missouri that graze on grass die of selenium deprivation. So what they do now for when they want selenium in it and they want those crops grown in those states, they ship them to one point, mix them all up, and ship them back to both states. But I, but your local food is your highest choice, and seasonal too is a good idea. When you're in winter climate, sometimes you need a little help uh, from elsewhere, and you will find that most whole foods have a certain amount of dietary fiber. It's part of their process that they use to uh, – it's actually their, their version of our cell wall. But, but we have sodium in our body that makes us flexible. They don't. So you will find that a plant actually has both uh, – there is no sodium-potassium difference between both layers, the fourth and third period of the periodic of the elements because they, they don't run. One of the problems in how they defend themselves is poison, whatever eats them. So that's what we think. Oh, they're here just grown for us. Not necessarily. Those plants don't like us eating them. Now, they have a tolerance level for that. In Africa, the uh, elk or whatever they had there was eating these pl- – would eat these plants. They'd be fine. There'd be no problem with the, uh, with the plants because they figured – the plants figured, let them graze a little bit of us. we got plenty to spare. But then there was a famine, and they started eating the plants. Suddenly, all the elk died. So they came and investigated and realized that – Due to salicylic acid and salicylate, they can actually transfer messages to the next plant and say, something's coming at you. It's eating me up. Protect yourself. So then they use that same acid and other things, the same thing that makes an aspirin and makes poisons, and they all drop dead. They were all dead. So they finally figured out that the plants were smart enough to communicate with salicylic acid and actually use it as one of the poisons. It's, it's a minor poison. They have much more potent poisoning, solanine in potatoes. In fact, you want to get solanine in potato, beat it up. It sounds funny, but go, go, give it stress, Ex- excessive cold, uh, excessive heat, excessive whatever. It protects itself with sol- solanine. Any bug attacks it, guess what? Solanine, we're going to poison it and colachinine or whatever the other ones are. All these plants, uh, when they are attacked, celery is the worst. When celery is attacked, there are people who have actually died from celery. And it's a really healthy food, usually. Even might be one of the things that can fight yellow fat disease. Uh, uh, I meant to talk to you about that. Dirk Pearson gave some options about that. And he, and I, I had, still have to look into this. But the herbs that have been known historically to fight free radical reactions, and according to Dirk Pearson and Sandy Shaw, they actually work better than BHT and BHA, particularly the rosemary. But they use cloves, oregano, rosemary, sage, vanilla, celery, frankincense, and myrrh were common ones. And I know that frankincense, even though it's an oil, is a very powerful uh, plant that actually – uh, there's examples of people who lived uh, by the frankincense uh, uh, trees and actually have all of their teeth and they're like 100 years old still. So, oh. you know, it's interesting. But I, you know, but I I haven't investigated them thoroughly yet. I was just surprised to go through my old copy of Life Extension who, who uh, 
totally dissed EPA, DHA, but now I heard he turned tail. He joined the crowd, which is surprising because his whole life extension is anti-oil severely, and DHA and EPA particularly he goes off on. Go figure. Wow. That's fascinating. I might. I, I have an essential oil diffuser. I used to diffuse while I sleep. I got to figure out frankincense and myrrh is safe for my cat, but probably. I'd yeah, probably uh, most of them are, but you do have to check it because some like like uh, avocados. Ray Pete doesn't like them, but but I do eat them because they have a lot of mono fats and things. But you pay feed them to a pet, you kill the pet. Yeah, wow. so so that that's kind of an argument against avocados. I've eaten them all my life and have one for breakfast, half of one every day, practically, and I'm still here. They Surprisingly, they have more mono-protective uh, fats and less omega-3s than, uh, than uh, Ray Pete. I'd like to ask him about that sometime because I know he's not a fan of avocados. So if you're a Ray Peter out there, don't follow my advice. Well, the other day I had some like chicken and fish tacos and I took my vitamin E, you know, and didn't worry about it. But it was like corn tortilla and avocados and cilantro. And it's it's rare. I mean, a few times a month I'll do something like that. Yeah. But um, you know, a, a little fish and particularly the warm water fish. Mm -hmm. Cod, if you don't eat the liver, it's a dry fish. There's not mm -hmm. that much DHA, EPA in it. So a lot of people have eaten cod and they just don't eat the liver. If you stay away from the liver, and a lot of fish do that, but people should ask why the longest living fish has the lowest DHA, orange ruffy, and they live for 200 years. Let's see a salmon make it to 200 years. Let's see them make it for a decade. <laughs> wow. Um, let's jump into the Q&A, Adam, because I have a good segue here. Okay. Someone asked, uh, explain how potatoes become the perfect protein um, is the the keto acids? I think our first interview we, you talked about that, but they combine with ammonia, right? The keto acids. Exactly, the ammonia in your body is. You see, the doctors say, "Oh, there's too much potassium in the potato. If you have a kidney problem, don't take it." Ray Pete says nonsense in very clear words with an explanation point. He said because the ketones in your in in the potato actually sop up the extra ammonia in your body. So you actually got a benefit for the kidneys, according to him. I've seen mild research. I don't have heavy research on that. Uh, and I don't worry about the potato starch itself. I dextrinize it, which Ray Pete is not a fan of. I dry heat. In fact, there's something called protein coagulation, where the ideal way to eat a potato is at 200 degrees, but you have to cook it for like uh, – 12 hours that way. So I don't bother. I stick to about 350 and get a type of called pyrodextrinization. When I asked him a question about that on uh, KMUD, when he used to be on that station, uh, he misunderstood me and thought I was talking about the, the chemical form of dextrinization they do. And actually, there's about 20 forms of dextrinization, so it gets, uh, it gets complicated. And here's something that Ray Pete may not know. I was surprised to find this. He says, don't dextrinize or caramelize your potato. The ketones only form at 350 to 400 degrees from the caramelization. I would really like to inquire of him about that. <laughs> so anyway, we caramelize our baked potatoes. I've been eating them all my life. I've loved potatoes. Uh, Susie, vibrant gal here, is from Hungary. They lived on potatoes. <laughs> they had lots of potatoes. Potatoes and the Irish did really well with potatoes and dairy, potatoes and dairy. They were very fit. And the only reason they starved to get de death on that island is because of politics. They could have easily got the food, but they refused to give it to them because they were going to alter the price of potatoes. You know, like during the Roosevelt administration where they burned all the potatoes and the food and everything so that they could maintain the price. Still happens today. Wow. Well, yeah, that's pretty much my diet, like eggs, um, eggs, potatoes, um, grass fed, grass finished, red, red meat, uh, yep. and dairy. I, I've been start started to make goat cheese, which feels better on my gut than the goat milk. So I uh, make huge batches of goat cheese and with vinegar and we'll just snack on that. <laughs> 
I do better with the cheeses too. I uh, the, uh, the milk. I take a little bit of it, and Susie uses about a couple of quarts in a week. Uh, and I take the residual once in a while, like a little sugar in it, and take it for a little tonic. But I like the cheeses, so I'm eating the uh, goat cheese and some of the cow cheeses too. That's great. So you, you predicted the next question because it was about uh, k- kidney health. And uh, someone asked about kidney stones. Why do they happen and what to do about them? Uh, Omega-3s are involved in those too, to a degree. They, they can, they can uh, you can have, uh, it's one of the list here is some kind of yellow kidney disease and kidney failure. I think there's three names for it someplace on here along with fatty necrosis and all the other names. But what you want to do is have the correct amount of liquid coming through. There's three ways to get kidney stones mainly. Actually, I researched and found about 40 ways. You can actually get cranberry, you can, cranberry can actually cause kidney stones. Very rare, so I wouldn't worry about it because cranberry can actually keep things moving too. But the three main ways are acidification through uric acid, uh, alkalinization through, uh, Basically, it's a calcium phosphate, calcium phosphate. That's another thing that rapey doesn't like, the phosphates. And, uh, and the third one is infection, struvite. And so in infection, guess what? Sugar. <laughs> so probably you could eliminate one third of them right that by just making the proper amount of sugar so you didn't get in stress and have inflammatory reactions or hyperinflammatory reactions. Wow. Interesting. Um, what about uh, pork and poofas? Because I made a post. I have bacon maybe once or twice a year on average. I never crave it. It's just kind of to, to you know, throw, throw things up and change my routine. But um, chicken and pigs store poofa. That kind of blew some people's mind because they, they can't, like ruminants can actually detoxify the poofas, right? Right. They ca- they can. There is some evidence. I found cases of them getting yellow fat disease, but not near as commonly. And a lot of people don't know that there have cattle have been raised entirely on fish before, and they still survived from it. In ocean villages where they couldn't grow anything else, they actually fed them fish. Uh, cows aren't entirely vegetarian. They eat a mouse or two or something like that if it gets in the way or little reptiles and stuff. And they eat it kind of as a snack. Just like chimpanzees that are supposed to be vegetarians occasionally eat another monkey or eat something else uh, uh, just as a snack every uh, couple of weeks or so like that. Uh, But anyway, cows seem to have a resistance. Horses are the worst. If people are going to eat horse meat, cases of yellow fat disease are the easiest to find. They have photos of the meat being yellow brown uh, on the internet. And I've quoted that in a lot of my books too, but the pictures are out there for people to see. And uh, pigs and chickens too. Now, chickens, if you don't feed them the omega-3s, then they do pretty well. But guess what they're doing now? Oh, we're making you healthy. We're going to put omega-3s in the chickens. They're going to eat them. And you get DHA and EPA in the chickens. Uh, Bacon, by the way, according to Ray Pete, is the healthiest pork you can eat. And he he assumes maybe it's the sodium, but it's the healthiest. If you're going to eat pork, eat bacon. I used to love bacon. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, my, my friend's dating a girl that um, I guess she has a ranch where they train um, like racing horses, California. And uh, he told me a story where she brought home like fast food meat and, and tried to feed it to the horse and the horse sniffed it and ran off it freaked it out it hated it <laughs> amazing amazing yeah horses are smart but they uh if they graze in certain uh, omega-3 rich areas they get it it's very common for uh, all horses have a certain degree of yellow fat disease because they graze and remember they graze on what we choose as human beings to, to feed them horses in the wild they had a much better choice of menu. <laughs> you know, they were they were meant to roam the plains like a lot of the a lot of the horses that the Spanish brought to the U.S. They uh, they just went wild. They'd let them loose. That's how the Indians got a hold of them because they were they had never ridden a horse before. Yet they became some of the greatest horse horsemen in the world. <laughs> no no saddles, no no stirrups too. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. It's funny here in Idaho, like a lot of people have horses, whether in the South or the North. 
And I've never ridden one, but it seems like a sustainable way to get around. I always think, you know, if society collapsed, what would happen? And it's like, well, I can't get gas. Probably couldn't charge my little, I don't know. I have a little e-bike, so I'm kind of counting on that to use. <laughs> Horses are good. The, uh, you know, we have a famous area, a uh, man in this area called the Horse Whisperer. His exact name I forget, but he, he once was challenged to go out and take a really wild horse and in 24 hours tame it. And he did it. But he said it was too much work. He prefers to work with ones that are already in the corral and stuff. But he's still got his ranch up uh, up north here in uh, San uh, Cedro, I believe. Wow. Um, this is a good question. Some studies show omega-3s can be beneficial for certain types of cancer. What is your view? You know what? It's an interesting thing. Uh, the cure for cancer is old age. So sometimes on prostate cancer, it can't slow it down. But then you die of heart attacks and things. A lot of people don't realize why cancer therapies usually make a person die of heart attack or tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is a cure for cancer, but and it, you live a little longer. So it can have a, a beneficial effect in some cancers like prostate for a little while. But look, omega-3s also cause prostate cancer. And in fact, once you have a prostate can cancer, to keep it from spreading, cancer grows in an acid state. But by the time a person's in their 90s, a man, almost surely they have some kind of cancer. But it doesn't spread, so it's okay. But once you take become alkaline, and a perfect way to do that is omega-3 fatty acids, it metastasizes. Even the treatment, uh, omegas freeze Revisi compared to chemotherapy. <laughs> he actually compared the same thing. He said, in fact, you make radiation causes your other fats to break down into omega threes. He said, so so obviously he was biased against omega threes, except for th certain therapies it could be used. Like say a person has a transplant. Transplant doctors use omega threes because your body loses its immunity. That means to everything else, so too, you know, infections, candida, whatever. But it does keep you from rejecting the organ. So they're smart enough to use omega-3s for that purpose, the ones in the nose. You can find that in the books. Transplant doctors do know about that. That's interesting. Um, yeah, I've been diving into studies. It's hard to find them, um, but like gamma tocopherol, um, I found a study from 2003. Where it actually stops the creation of prostaglandin e E2 or PGE2, um, which is pretty important. Like a lot, of, I, I guess a lot of the different ice, um, isomers of vitamin E will, will specifically alpha and gamma will stop the breakdown of omegas into these toxic, you know, icosanoids and all the. As I understand it, every plant on Earth has at least a minimum amount of tocopherols. And the gamma is the most common food to go for all. There's the four types. The ones that's uh, being sold now that it can actually neutra neutralize the tocopherols is the tocotrienols, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. They, there's only three plants that use it in the earth. There are very few. There's probably more. Three well-known ones that they use. I think rice is one and palm is another one and something else. But why would only a few plants use that? Well, meanwhile, the tocopherols are used by every plant in the earth, and probably the ones that use the tocotrienols are also rich in tocopherols. I haven't checked that out, and I haven't seen the research on that. Someone else out there, one of your listeners, might want to do some research on that. Help us yeah, out. There's, <laughs> yeah, maybe I'm biased because I sell a, vitamin, a mixed tocopherol vitamin E in like MCT oil, but there's a Asian guy like Dr. Barry Tan that's been making the rounds on biohacking podcasts and alternative health podcasts promoting his tocotrienol product. And I listen to pretty much all his interviews because I like to always hear the devil's advocate side of the argument. And it didn't make sense to me because all the, like I have bookmarked here, I have a vitamin E folder with all these studies and it's all tocopherol that help with lipid peroxidation. <laughs> so it's interesting. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Uh, back in the day, uh, because I did so many things. Uh, I got a business card that had all this list of things that it did. And I showed it to a good friend of mine named Hugo Conte and said, what do you think of my new business card? He said, you know, frankly, if I went into an auto supply store and something said, said it did all these things, I put it back in the shelf 
and walk out. I took the, the disprinted business cards and threw them all in the trash. Well, that's that's actually the thing about uh, about omega threes. Now we should be suspicious when it works from everything from backache to cancer to bone health to this to that to that. The list gets ridiculous. Name any syndrome, put omega three in, it cures it. Well, obviously we're being sold a load of crap here, frankly, on omega threes because usually the things that it's supposed to be curing, like Alzheimer's disease, it's the cause of it. Look at the lipofuscin that occurs in in those uh, in the dementias and Alzheimer's, even in Crohn's disease. Pre Crohn's disease is called brown bowel syndrome, and I just found that out recently. I knew there was a brown bowel syndrome, but I didn't know that pre Crohn's before it gets bad enough to be called Crohn's, it is brown bowel syndrome. That's lipofuscin. That's what makes that brown color. It's not just yellow fat disease. It should be named yellow, orange, uh, yellow, brown, orange, brown, and brown, and even black. It, as it ages, it gets darker and darker and darker with other chemicals and the proteins that inhabit the lipofuscin. That's really fascinating because I met some people here in Idaho that have Crohn's disease. And my friend Rob Matt, like fraternian MMA fighter I've had on the show, and he's big into Chinese herbs and stuff. And um, even being fruitarian, he recommends raw egg yolks for Crohn's disease. And he's like, every hour have a raw egg yolk. And uh, I've been recommending that. Maybe it's the choline because choline, I know, helps detoxify PUFA. Uh, choline can help. Yeah, yeah, it's possible. It's in fish, but you get, it's in a lot of other sources too. Again, warm water fish, no problem. You know, mm-hmm. uh, Ray Pete says some of the tropical fish are like butter the fat because they don't need to be they don't need antifreeze because what a salmon is using it for is antifreeze because obviously their oil is going to freeze up and be like a solid fat when you're at uh, 32 degrees or whatever temperature yeah i think if people can just get that little idea because the skepticism i get every day on my social media like um can you show me the research and i'll usually send them ray's article um, he has like uh, essential fatty acids, toxic or essential or something. I usually send them that article, but just that basic idea that PUFAs are antifreeze, it just makes logical sense that it wouldn't work in our tropical body. <laughs> yeah. And, and on earth, uh, on, on the surface of the earth, they blow up ships. What kind of, that's like putting dynamite in your gas tank instead of that's a high octane <laughs> or a yeah, low and, octane, and, however that works. And the characters promoting it, um, Martin Marietta, NASA, and the WHO, right? I mean, those are the big ones. That's the big ones, yeah. The the whole algae oil came from uh, NASA and Martin Marietta. They changed their name. And now, ironically, two of the main uh, sellers of Omega-3s are mining companies because that's what Marietta is mostly into now. They've changed their name slightly, I believe. And the other one, I don't remember the name of the Dutch – I think it's a Dutch company. They're a mining company. They're the ones that are selling the most algae oil omega threes these days, and a lot of them are raised with corn oil too. You've probably seen the scandal with Horizon Milk and a whole bunch of baby foods and things. Organic food is allowed to have these in. I think they may have been changing the laws now, but there were about hundreds of products organic that were allowed to put. To, to put this type of non-organic product made in outer space and now in big vats. Think of the money. It's like an eight-story vat with a turnover in 24 hours. Where can you buy, go, try and grow a carrot in 24 hours and sell it? Man, there's a lot of money in it. It's huge, huge amounts of money. That's amazing. Yeah, when I was selling algae oil years ago, you know, I was aware of your work, and then I went to the health food store, and I started looking at I would always study products and I looked at this organic horizon milk and I was like, why are they fortifying it with algae oil and vitamin D and vitamin A? And it took years for that seed to sprout in my mind. And now I speak out about supplementing, uh, you know, retinol palmitate or storage form of D3 uh, or algae oil. It's like, you just have to look at what they're poisoning us with and then kind of go the other direction. (laughs) It's true. You know, the most sensitive probably animal on earth to uh, yellow fat disease are crocodiles and alligators. So you could actually poison them by 
putting pieces of meat and put DHA and EPA in it and feed it to them and it rubberizes them very quickly. Right now, I don't know if you've heard about all the crocodiles in Africa that are rubberizing and they're trying to blame toxins. But if you search deep enough, you will find that a type of fish that is algae eating worked its way into these areas. They're high in DHA and EPA. Another fish ate that. The catfish ate that. The alligators ate that. And they all rubberized and died. And they're trying to blame toxins and everything else. But even the first article I saw by National Geographic, which, by the way, don't trust them. They're in cahoots with NASA. The first article tried to say poison. And someone in the comment on the internet said, Idiots! It's yellow. It's 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 yellow fat disease, like cats. <laughs> I had to laugh at that. That's interesting. So, what what would I search to find that, like crocodiles rubberizing, or is there a, a more is there a term they use for I, it, or uh, what is the word? I'll, I'll send you something about it. But uh, put alligators yellow fat disease. You'll probably get it that way. Uh, okay. Or crocodiles yellow fat disease. Uh, they call it. Uh, you could possibly do rubberizing. I haven't oh. looked that up for a couple of years. Even Wikipedia, yeah. I think, talks about the alligators being vulnerable to uh, to uh, uh, to lipofuscinosis, but they don't mention in their entire thing. They never mention omega three fatty acids at all, which is absolutely amazing. They give seven causes of lipofuscin and don't mention omega threes. Last time I looked, I haven't looked now for several months that could change it you know they're always editing and updating things yeah i find found here journal of zoo and wildlife medicine 2013 uh pink of nile crocodile in that's south africa called yellow fat disease pan- yeah. it's on my <laughs> list right here pan- <laughs> pancreatitis and pancreatitis and steatitis and blah 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 <laughs> says to yeah. date no definitive causative agent has been identified yeah, right. <laughs> Here's another thing that people used to uh, used to flummox me at first. What about bears? They eat salmon. How come they don't get yellow fat disease? They do. The ones that eat the salmon have much more higher rates than the inland bears. And most bears, people don't know, they're 87 percent uh, vegetarian. They eat sedges and grasses when they come out. And they're like buzzards. When they come out of hibernation, all these animals that didn't survive, they feast on them. And then they go down and get the grasses and the sedges because they know that's better for them or the com- combination of both. But they only eat fish uh, when they storage. It's easy. You see them jumping up there, but they get more yellow fat disease and uh, than the inland bears that don't eat salmon. Wow. Well, I think this um, – let's see. Actually, no, I missed a question on PUFA. Um, when did you begin limiting PUFA and did you notice changes when you started doing it? <laughs> you know, I combined with several things, but uh, I've always been pretty healthy. I've eaten a type of circadian nutrition called solar nutrition, and I've eaten pretty well. You hear me talk about junk food. I have indulged in junk food at one time. When I was a vegetarian, I would buy cases of vegetarian chili and things like that. And so, It was hard for me to be in a yoga class without passing gas or mucus or something. But I pretty much have eaten pretty healthy most of my life. But I started to get some problems. One was edema. And uh, and so uh, that was about the time I discovered Ray Pete. And I thought, what is going on here? So my right leg swelled up once and then it went away. Then it got worse. Now I was concerned because I've seen people with edema like that. And uh, so then I cut off my tuna fish entirely, which I was eating regularly. I cut off my mayonnaise entirely, and I started introducing more sugar and more PD type things. It went away. The edema last time about five years ago. And also because of that, that one leg, my right leg was always the ankle was a little larger than the other. They're both the same size now. And uh, the other thing, weirdly, I couldn't sit in a cross-legged position because my right leg wouldn't go down. So I would have to force it down. And as soon as I started eating sugar and abandoned that, I could put it down perfectly. I can sit in the tailor position now for a long time. Also, another thing that happened when I introduced the oranges, I tried vitamin C and other things because uh, 
when I would wipe my butt, I had to be really careful because there would be some blood on the teeth. So I would have my pants down and waddle over to the sink, wet the toilet paper, wipe it. Everything's fine then. Well, after I started the more peaty things, and the oranges probably is what did it, guess what? I could sandpaper my butt now and not make it bleed. I could wipe it with sandpaper. I've even gone in and nothing. Not a trace of blood for like uh, six years since I started doing the oranges and things. We do the oranges every day. An orange every once in a while we miss on market day when we have to we get late on our schedule going to the market on Saturdays, but mostly every day. That's really cool. Yeah, the the bioflavonoids in the orange, uh, even just the orange juice, like the narogenin and the apigenin, seem to have tremendous effects, like both as an aromatase inhibitor, and I believe they also shut down the synthesis of cortisol. Uh, a lot of stuff. <laughs> it seems to be a miracle food, and I didn't eat that many oranges. I tried the vitamin C. None of that ever had an effect on wiping my butt. And I think that started about 15, 20 years ago. Uh, and... Uh, but now, completely gone. And, uh, you know, Ray Pete says there's a guy in Florida that may have lived to 150 years old. He didn't have any money, so he just lived in the fields and ate nothing but oranges. And, of course, it takes the iron out of your system if you're don't have it, if you not eating iron-rich foods with it. So he lived supposedly to 150. He claimed it was in a Florida newspaper. Wow. <laughs> By the way, I pulled up uh... – Pantsteitis? That's a hard word to say. I think that's on purpose. <laughs> <It is>. but <laughs> I know. I know. In, on this dictionary website, it, said, it calls it yellow fat disease, a vitamin E deficiency syndrome affecting various mammals, in particular cats who are fed excess omega-3 PUFAs from fish oils, especially tuna. <laughs> yep. You know, here's the funny thing, uh, and vets don't know this. Almost every vet knows what yellow fat disease is. Because they bring a cat in, they say, don't eat tuna, and they get addicted to it. Cats don't eat fish normally. They don't eat fish. The ones around here, mice and birds, not fish. But when they're fed it, they get addicted. Well, they get these little tumors and things on them. Dogs do too, but cats are even more vulnerable. And so you have to get them off it. Well, they go crazy. They won't eat anything, and so people panic and give them the fish again. Well, anyway, the vets say, don't let him eat anything for three or four days. He'll get over it. And don't give him tuna. Now, the tuna you get in cat food is fake tuna. It's kitty crack. It's not tuna at all, so they don't have a problem. But now the same vets do not understand that the fish oil is the DHA. Like when I say don't eat fish oil, they say, well, where will I get my DHA? That's like saying uh, if I don't get my lead, where do I get my lead? <laughs> so... The the uh, now they put DHA and EPA. It's another huge market for putting it in the fish, and they don't realize they're killing the pets by giving them the equivalent of tuna. You know, it's I almost started thought of starting my own cat food brand because um, I my cat I, I tried to give her raw meat, which is like the best thing I think you could feed a cat or a dog, and she wouldn't eat it. Maybe I have to starve mm -hmm. her until she eats it, but. There's a brand like I and Love and You, it's called, and she eats the dry food and the wet food. But unfortunately, both of them have, uh, like one has salmon oil, I think, the, the wet food, and then the other one has another PUFA oil. There's vitamin E with both of them, though, so I wonder if that's kind of countering it. <laughs> that can that can counter it, and maybe the I think a lot of these people know what they're doing, so they do that, so you don't obviously get it. I firmly believe that the reason they tell you to eat fish two or three times only because of the mercury and everything else is because they know if you ate it seven days a week, you'd obviously get yellow fat disease and the symptoms of it. That's what I think is going on. But you do, you accumulate dioxins and everything in the fish because everything, again, runs down the hill. You're better up in the mountain because the water is pure. If you're down in the valley, everything that's flushed down someone else's toilet or cesspool or drug or they take a, they pee something when they're on estrogenic chemicals or some kind of drug goes down into their water supply. So the higher you up, the better. I, I knew real estate people. I had a buddy of mine and his mother had been buying real estate for a long time. She always went up in the mountain because she knew everything runs downhill. <laughs> that's probably why my cat's so healthy. Like I have. I'm on a well, but then I super filter it. So take 
you know, every bit of iron out, every bit of calcium out. You can put magnesium bicarbonate in. So maybe that's why my cat has a nice coat and everything. <laughs> is it a male cat or a female cat? Female. Yeah, because they they are hunters. They usually will hunt. The, the, the male cats don't like to hunt uh, that much. It's like lions. You know, the lioness does the hunting, and the and the lion sticks around and roars. So <laughs> we have two cats here that live in the property that we uh, we've become affectionate with. They're really really nice cats. But the male doesn't catch anything. The females always got a a rodent or a bird. In fact, the 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 little rodents are attacking my car down here if i have a light and a and a sound device and all kinds of things but she once in a while is catches these mice for me so i i applaud her <laughs> i've seen that they can get in the hood i think i actually experienced that once they get under the hood of your car right <laughs> yes yes it's been it's been uh, for the last two or three years they've been eating my car the insulation is all completely eaten out of the dash the part there yeah, it's been a perpetual war, and finally, I think I got a handle on it with the uh, with this little sound device and a lantern all night. My hood's up all the way with a lantern on, and the cats are around, and I'm doing pretty well. They're like goats; they eat anything. Like I have a copper supplement to give goats, and it's like literally copper metal shavings, and they look so harsh. They're like spiky metal that you feed the goat. They get stuck in their intestines and they get the slow release of copper. <laughs> they have excellent, uh, excellent uh, digestive uh, organs, and their form of milk is the is the closest common form. Donkey milk is actually the closest to human milk. And the British, when they found this guy, it's going to sound unbelievable to people, but they buried him for forty days, and he they brought him out alive. The British thought well, he's just an ignorant savage. He believes this. Let's show him. We'll put him under sentry. We'll bury him in a box. We'll put him in a building. We'll have 24-hour sentries, and we'll dig up the dead body in 40 days. He came out alive. <laughs> it took him about an hour to revive him. And so then the British wanted to know, what are they doing? And they found out that the so-called prana that the Indians called is carbon dioxide. It's a carbon dioxide. So the British military has extensive records of the carbon dioxide levels in in foods, starting with donkey milk is the best. And all of these guys that buried, they lived solely on donkey milk and stayed in the dark because somehow activating the sun, it wouldn't work. Now, figure, I don't know what they did for their vitamin D there. Maybe they got it out of the donkey milk, but uh, it's an amazing thing. And the uh, and by the way, the second, uh, I think camel's milk is high, but goat's milk for, for readily available is the closest to mother's milk that you can get compared to cow's milk. Wow. I've heard Ray say that if you live on milk, which you can, you'll eventually get an iron deficiency, which is almost impossible to get. That's probably, I know iron kind of inhibits the whole process of generating carbon dioxide because it inhibits yeah. utilization of oxygen. So. Well, you know, I was one of the first people to realize that uh, that uh, iron was really bad before they started taking it out of vitamins. So this one guy came along, he was a Catholic priest, and he would get iron supplements. And I noticed that all of his other supplements had iron in them. So I warned him. He said, no, no, I need my iron. He went to the doctor and he said, you have uh, anemia from eating too much iron. Now, I never heard of that either. I still haven't heard, but he came back and said, I can't eat iron. What am I going to do? So I had to get him. A, they didn't have the complete product at that point. So I had to select one of this, one of that. You get three in this one and put together a formula with no iron in after that. So I've been aware of the iron problem for, for some time. And when years ago in 1960, I hitchhiked across the country with nothing but two dollars a bottle of geritol and a bottle of tang i ate the tang for food to survive and i took the geritol thinking it was going to really help me they believed at that time eat take your geritol and i hitchhiked seven days with only having one burger someone treated me to a burger someone to a meal and the rest was just uh five cent crackers and gas stations on my two dollars and uh, Duratol and eating the tang, so it would be like food. <laughs> I, I was 123 pounds. I looked like I escaped from a concentration camp when I got home. My parents were freaked out. But anyway, I, I was taking Geritol because I believe, you know, they, they made such a good case. Iron is good. Iron fortified uh, cereal, iron fortified this. 
and actually uh it's really really bad as we know now yeah i remember um earlier this year i think i was at a used bookstore and i was reading a book and it was uh, a health book and it's interesting how a lot of the old health books they'll have like a whole chapter on iron and it's some of it's you know horror stories and then some are you know positive but this one was talking about a guy that supplemented it and within months he created like a heart disease kind of issue of, of supplementing high dose iron. <laughs> definitely. Yeah. It, it uh, can definitely cause it. And particularly iron works with pupas, particularly mm-hmm. omega threes again. So in a way it, it, it of course actually lipofuscin has small amounts of minerals, maybe one or 2%, but that small percent of iron, is one of the major activators of lipofuscin to make it do its damage. The research is there. Anybody can look at it. And by the way, when people tell you that about uh, omega-3 being so good, you're going to find so many studies. People send it to me all the time. What about this? And they don't realize. I've seen all of those studies. There's almost none I haven't seen. But the thing is to tell them, why does it always cause yellow fat disease? You ask them that. If it heals your brain and gives you yellow fat disease, you know, Eventually, if anyone would just not look up omega-3 fatty acids, look up yellow fat disease, put it in parentheses and go through and even stutter search. That means yellow fat disease in parentheses, do it again. You get a whole new thing. You sabotage their system. The other trick is to pretend you're a wholesaler of omega-3s. It's social engineering. It's legal. In this case, you go in and pretend you're someone else. They let you in and give you the secret information. That's what in my latest book, that's what I'm I'm getting that kind of information because I realize uh, I'm I'm going for the companies now and see what they're up to. And they admit that they're they're buying litigation to get uh, DHA legal in uh, in like Europe and other places and, and get all their drugs out again, 88 drugs. Why would they put EPA and DHA in drugs? Wouldn't the drug by itself be good enough? Why would they have to add in 88 drugs so far in the pipeline? The, the, it's like a, a land rush into uh, wow. into farm, big pharma now with fish oils. I think this is the last question on it. Top three things to eradicate lipofuscin. I would imagine like sugar, saturated fat, and small amounts of alcohol. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, to eradicate it with vitamin E, you know, yeah. when, when in doubt, vitamin E is going to be there because what they don't want you to know is this a- anti-estrogenic. It's not mm-hmm. just antioxidant. Antioxidant doesn't really mean that much. In fact, antioxidant is how cancer grows and oxidant is how it spreads. But, but vitamin E is super. Remember the shoots, William Shoots and all, all that research when I was growing up was out there about how vitamin E could increase your sex life and everything, which it can. And uh, guess what? They repressed all that because they were selling estrogen and telling women it was a female hormone when that's all a lie too. Anybody can find more information from Ray Pete on that. That's his speciality. Well, since you brought up sex life. <laughs> uh, here we go. <laughs> you, you just wrote uh looks like two newsletters on sex and when i saw your facebook post about that i got excited because um i just love that you're a contrarian and like you, a lot of the stuff you share blows people's minds because it's the exact opposite of what they hear and from every biohacker every alternative health podcast or uh, educator it's always about uh semen retention specifically for males but you actually said for males, that actually increases testosterone, right? Uh, but yeah, actually, because your desire does it. Now, I don't necessarily recommend it, but porno increases the desire. You have two ways of increasing testosterone. One is touch. That's usually attributed to ox- oxytocin. It has a lot to do with testosterone through a separate circuit. The other is visualization. When you get a naughty thought in your head, then you start thinking you don't need the touch part. Both of those together, and then it's pretty easy to get uh, to, to get sexual. Sexual. In fact, in I think my latest newsletter, the research is out for a long time that movement stimulates 
testosterone and sexual hormones. If you watch someone, even like Michael Jackson or Dancing with the Stars, the dancing part, you actually build testosterone and makes you turned on and can actually make a person softy go lofty from watching that. Movement was done in about 1899 where they took an ergograph and measured uh, movement. And they found if you had something, if you heard the noise, uh, the uh, the cycles, it wouldn't work. But if you saw a moving wheel with the cycles, automatically your hormones went up and, and your seminal fluid increased and things of that nature. And of course, uh, I'm against seminal retention. I think there might be a limit. But when I was a newlywed, wow, this is really good stuff. Twice a day for two years, I'm still alive. And then... I had a lot of five wives. I mean, uh, I did a, a lot of uh, a lot of non-seminal retention. Let's put it that way. And then <laughs> I met a guy I was jealous of. He was he was uh, actually five times a day. His wife swore at that time. Now he he had so much testosterone that he was a gangster. We finally uh, we finally. I mean, he couldn't drive through a twenty five mile zone without going seventy five miles an hour. He probably ended up in prison. So maybe that much testosterone was too much. But anyway, the, you can have a limit. the The Indians used to create uh, chemical units instead of cutting off their organs. What they would do is have them. Uh, masturbate, I guess we can talk about this, all day, and then ride horses, which made the horses, made them uh, shake out the seminal fluid. And then their actual organs would deteriorate, their beard would go away and things. So you can take tremendous amounts, but they did it. They basically forced the person to continuously be doing this. Uh, Actually, a person can be healthy. Uh, If you don't use it, you lose it. Many people find that they can't use it because the body says, well, you're not using it anyway. We're going to shut this system down. It's like, it's like, do I want to have bowel retention? I I don't want to go to the bathroom, but once a week, because I'm working in this company, you know, and I have to wear a big suit and it's a lot of trouble to take my pants off. It makes just as much sense actually. Uh, So I think, I think in our previous chat, you were saying the porn star was eating tons of tuna so there's a lot of PUFA in the semen, right? So it's actually a detox for PUFA. <laughs> yeah, he was actually taking it out. Yeah, he wore he bought the big cans of tuna like that. And uh, I'm looking up his name because I'm going to do a one of my newsletters is going to have an article. Basically, it's a magazine. It's not really a newsletter because it's uh, I put 12 stories as the deal and an introduction. And uh, I go into various uh, subjects about this, but it's surprising Back in the day, about uh, 1900, uh, seminal retention was considered part of the eugenics program. And if you had a kid as a parent, you would – and you caught them playing with themselves, you would bring them to a doctor and they would perform operations on them. This was done in hundreds, maybe thousands of cases. Well, I found books back then that had the counter. Uh, way before Kinsey came out with all these shocking things, there were more shocking things back there. Havelock, Ellis, and a whole bunch of other sexologists uh, did the facts, and they noticed, do animals uh, masturbate uh, it, alone or in, uh, in, in the wild? And all of those facts are surprising. That uh, I think there might be a limit, like uh, – I, I, I don't think one or two times a day is a problem, though, for, for most men. And it's also patriarchal. Women can ejaculate because they're inferior, but men have a higher brain. This is based on the idea of kundalini, which is an incorrect, partially uh, – fish can build your kundalini, but it can't uh, blame what you call uh, – Cosmodyne energy is what they called it. They have more like a life force. It's, a, it's The idea of the aura is actually the light that you emanate. But some of that light must be conserved because they find out that we radiate light. You know, if you close your eyes, you get photons. photons. They actually can do measurements of light coming out of our body. And strangely enough, the more toxic we are, the more light we emanate because we're wasting it. So I'd conserve my light, but not the seminal fluid. Because as long as you're eating and supplying 
food back in, it builds up very easily out of protein, sodium, and the, the minerals are all clearly written out in various places. In fact, I actually should put that in my newsletter. It's been, a se- semen has been analyzed to a fairly well, where they know every chemical that's going to be in it, and including the ones that shouldn't be there. Hmm. Interesting. Um I still have, I, I think I was trying to sell it, but I'm kind of glad now that I didn't call that GDV gas discharge visualization camera. Um, mm-hmm. Dr. Uh, Konstantin Karatkov um, invented it. I think it was a Russian guy, I believe, or somewhere in Europe. Mm-hmm. But I was using this when I was hosting health, health retreats, which I plan to do again. But you pretty much put your finger in this little dark camera thing in each finger you take a picture of. And it's, it might be an advanced way to, to diagnose disease, I guess, technologically, because it not only looks at the UV light emitted off your fingers, but the pattern of it. Hmm. And then it'll kind of build a picture of like the aura, or you could talk, call it the, the photons coming off your body. And I guess where there's a gap, that's where you can tell, you know, what's which organ or gland is unhealthy, where there's a gap in your light, where it's emitting more or less, which is pretty cool. It kind of makes sense. (laughs) There's a little bit of truth to that. At one time, when I was uh, working at a metaphysical bookstore, I was actually interviewed on television because I had an aura detector. Basically, I forget exactly what it was. Basically, your your, uh, fingertips, the pressure is what determined the amount of your aura is all it was really. It was similar to a battery. But I didn't know that at the time. But then uh, I took one of the aura photographs of a, a woman. I told her about a Donald Lay who I studied with. And she went to him and she said, what's my trauma? Oh, oh, I asked what the trauma is over the phone when I showed I No, I showed him the picture of the aura photo. And he said, uh, tell her that, uh, how did he word it? One, one year ago you received a shock from someone that uh, that caused this. And when I told her on the phone, she said, uh, 300, let's see, uh, 362 days ago, I must see this man. But then I asked him how he did it. And he said, the fingerprint is actually a layout of how your body works. But people don't know how to read it that way. So you can actually read the energy coming out of your fingertips. Actually, the lipids can stay on your fingertips on a glass for, uh, God, look at all that sunshine. I mean, now I'm trying to get back a little so I don't light up the screen. You're going to activate your lip- the lipofuscin. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, really. <laughs> I don't have any, fortunately, or very little. Uh, anyway, the... Uh, if you put your fingertips on a glass, they actually have a type of laser that even if it goes through the washing machine for one year, you can read the fingerprints on that glass. That's how forensics is getting so detailed. But the oils in your fingers can actually uh, imprint. You can even massage a person and give them some of your genes. You know, Ray Pete has talked about that, the whole thing on uh, – endosomes are they exosomes or exosomes i believe uh, he said it's horizontal genetics now when he said that i didn't connect that before but horizontal genetics means that when you eat vegetables you actually take some of their genes in for sure pollen and things like that they realized a long time ago that elephants are impossible by vertical uh genetics it, they mate once every two years. They couldn't have developed over the period of time that they existed on Earth by normal means. But then horizontal genetics through viruses, doesn't herpes mutate you? Uh, doesn't AIDS mutate you? These are mutations. But what people don't realize, and I was surprised that Ray Pete knew all about this, that actually foods can mutate you too. You, the reason ethnic groups get certain foods into their genetics is RNA not DNA, they get this, they call it horizontal genetics, and vertical means father to son, grandfather to father to son. And uh, there's this other type of genetics. That's why when, when a woman sleeps with a man, and then they have another husband, and they have a baby with the second person, there are genetic uh, tracings of the other man in that baby. 
Wow. And that's been proven. In fact, a friend of mine was a dog breeder. And she, when, when I told her that, when I first learned that, she said, yeah, I, I've seen it. And if you go in the old medical textbooks, they knew about it too. Before they evolved the genome like they do today, they knew that that was possible. So something to think about. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Um, so is there some truth to that phrase, the vegetables are going to turn you into a vegetable? <laughs> yeah, it's somewhat. But, you know, vegetables are pretty smart, too. They actually have uh, – they actually think. Uh, Sir Jagadash Chandra Bose, yeah, if you've ever seen his research, he found out that metals are li- alive. The most conscious metal we have is uh, tin, remarkably, more so than zinc even. And he goes into his tests. His books are in the internet. Uh, Ray Pete often quotes Bose, which excited me. When I realized that Pete was into most of the people I was in, including the chronobiologist, Dr. Frank, uh, golly, I can't even think of his name now, but Brown, thank you. <laughs> that's my uh, that's my coach there. Uh, Frank Brown, he, he, uh, he discovered that uh, you could uh, affect potatoes underground in a cage, a vacuum cage, and that there was some kind of energy. Well, Ray Pete knows about this too. They phased him out of chronobiology with a meeting at Cold Springs Harbor to make it genetic. They wanted to say, this is already in us. The environmental is too much like astrology. And indeed, it is a type. We are affected by uh, environmental waves, think about Wi-Fi and things like that now, uh, and we get affected by them, and it can actually affect our DNA. And it was known, and when Frank Brown did that, he was called the father of bio, uh, of uh, circadian rhythms or chronobiology. They basically took the title away, and I think they finally gave him back a page on Wikipedia, but they put his successor, who was arranged in 1960 at a meeting at Cold Springs Harbor, what was that lab called before? The Eugenics Laboratory of America. For decades, it was called that. So you can't make this stuff up again. Wow. Speaking of circadian rhythm, someone asked about resting brain hemispheres instead of sleeping. I guess you've spoken on that in the past. They're curious how to do that. <laughs> you know, I haven't figured out how to do it, but the dolphin does it. They One half of their body shuts down and the other eye is awake, and then they shut down the other side. In other words, we we have two hemispheres of our brain, and he can do it. And supposedly, uh, that was the technique that Paramahansa Yogananda used. They didn't sleep. You know, I studied with a man who didn't sleep, but he said he did. But he could function while he was asleep. He was in a delta brainwave, but he was conscious. He was measured by Elmer Green at the, I believe it was the Manager Foundation when they did all those tests on people being able to control their own body through biofeedback. He was one of the pioneers, Elmer Green. And uh, one time a doctor asked him, how come it's taken me months to be able to control my brainwave to do something? And you can teach kids to do it in often a day or a week. And Elmer Green said, the reason is you're a doctor. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's the answer. <laughs> Children don't have any uh, preconcepts of things, so they can learn very simple things quickly. I've taught people applied kinesiology and stuff. The kids pick it up faster than anybody, while the adults, they, they, they just can't understand exactly how that works. This is not an endorsement of all kinesiology. Most of it is fake, by the way. Uh, but there is such a thing where you can measure meridians and muscle systems and organs uh, by certain types of muscle testing, but there's a lot of fakes out there. Beware. <laughs> Interesting. Did, did you ever, I don't know why this come to my mind. Did you ever see the movie called a beautiful mind? I did. Uh, it'd been a long time ago, but it was a very good, and a book was written by Caesar Lombroso, the father of, uh, criminology that showed that all genius had problems. And he wrote his book. It's on the internet. It, 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 well, I think it was in my first issue of uh, my magazine with uh, – who was it? Uh, Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer. Uh, Schopenhauer was against any kind of losing of seminal fluid. Yet guess what? Did he follow his own advice? No. He was uh, – he believed it was pollution, they called it. Voltaire, 
Schopenhauer, a whole bunch of people were totally against it. They were for seminal retention. They didn't live their words. Tolstoy wanted everybody to stop having sex so that the human beings would get over the earth. He had like uh, seven kids. He was married several times, and he had hundreds of concubines. What the heck is going on here? <laughs> because I believed all that about Tolstoy was celibate. And then, then there's been a movie even made about it called The Last Railroad Stop, something like that, Academy Award, Christopher Plummer and others. Really good movie about him. It shows the, uh, uh, the irony of how a celibate person is really not celibate. Wow. What's that one called again? Uh, something like the last stop or the last railway stop. Uh, Christo- okay. If you look up Christopher Plummer, you'll find it. And whoever played opposite him got the Academy Award that year for the movie. It, made, it won the Academy Award. Really good movie. And because I had been into Tolstoy, I think I read War and Peace years and years ago in high school, uh, that uh, I was fascinated by that movie. It was very well done. Interesting. Um while, while we were back on the topic of uh, sex, <laughs> does does ice cream threaten prostate health? No, no. It, you know, the chemical type does because most ice cream is made with a, a bunch of uh, chemicals. And believe me, I worked at Thrifty Drugstore and one of them, one of my jobs was to scoop that ice cream out. There are more chemicals than that. But if you make it at home, or you get a really, really good brand. And I'm not sure about haagen and Ben & Jerry's being that good. If you make it at home, it's one of the healthiest things you can eat. And I think once in a while, having some haagen or Ben & Jerry's is not going to hurt you. I prefer vanilla myself when I do. But ice cream, yeah, good I did, food. I just thought it got a two-quart ice cream maker. I just have to look up a really easy recipe. But one time, my friends and I made one with like 12 or 16 egg yolks. And I think the Bulletproof guy invented that and calls it like the get some ice cream because it's a like wow. libido booster, you know? <laughs> Sounds good. Well, eggs are a libido. Both fish and eggs are libido uh, bushes, uh, 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 boosters. So if it, I would actually advise a person maybe to take omega-3s if they were having trouble with a pregnancy. Now, there's much better ways to do that, frankly. But they're, you know, a sperm is a fish. It's got its little wiggly tail. Later, they call that kundalini. And look at us. We have a big ovum here. And look at the spine. Kundalini is that little rattlesnake rattling its tail at the bottom of the uh, – of the. it's simple physics. They don't have to make something metaphysical like kundalini force. Ooh, it does this. I had a kundalini reaction. I'm a kundalini casualty and all. It simply goes back to biology. The sperm – and the the head now the 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 uh, sperm delivers the programming. It's very light, and uh, but then the tail breaks off, and then the ovum grows it out of matter after that instead of just the DNA. So you get the genes, but the tail actually breaks off and forms it. But look at it; it's a sperm. The, the medulla oblongata is the head of the sperm. It goes down. It even has a tail at the end, the coccyx. And then, I mean, like, like, a, like a, a cobra almost. And then you get the brain, which is obviously an ovum. So we're made out of a sperm and ovum. And guess who's the boss? The sperm. I mean, the ovum. The ovum says that this is supposed to be the masculine part of us. It's actually the feminine part. It's a, it's a feminine part of us because the sperm doesn't have to move. This is the part that moves. We've got ambulators that walk all around. All the ovum has to say is, come here, big boy. And guess what? <laughs> Along comes the male. <laughs> Except on Sadie Hawkins Day, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I forget the number, but the the number of mitochondria in a woman's egg is like, I don't know, a hundred thousand per egg, and with the, with the sperm, it's like ten thousand. It's like it's a ridiculous difference, right? It is a difference, and we get the mitochondria from the mother, not from the father. There are exceptions to the rule they found out now, but it's really rare. Basically, your mitochondria are provided by mother matrix uh, uh, matter, matter mater, like in mater. And uh, that's where we get the physical part of our body. The sperm actually gives us the uh, the electronic part of our body more. So, hmm. um, my friend Dio asked. You mentioned endorphins being bad, and he's curious more on that. 
they can cause uh, uh, back problems and paralysis. There's a very good book by a scientist who wrote a huge book called, uh uh-oh, are you still around? What do I do? Yep, still. I'm just going to hit this little button and let him know I'm still here. Okay. Uh, He wrote a book called Zen in the Mind, I think, and, uh, and the Brain. And huge book. But he wrote about the mistaken uh, the mistake that endorphins are good for you. They actually are shocks for losers. If you have a race, a marathon race, the winner gets a dopamine reward. He doesn't get endorphins. The other ones, your reward for losing are endorphins and caffeines and other chemicals related to that. And so, but if you keep getting them, it can actually cause paralysis of the spine. The diseases are out there. I think Ray Pete knows about this too. So uh, you'll find that people get addicted too to running. There is such an addiction. Uh, I've, I've met people who can't uh, who can't uh, get out of that uh, the road race, uh, the rat race, and they uh, they have to run and run and run. Usually, it keeps them. They claim it keeps me away from alcohol. It keeps me away of things. And so, in a way, it has a kind of semi-therapeutic use like fish oil but in the end you get messed up by it but uh yeah you if you research them they are a problem now we lose every once in a while we're going to lose then we get it but why should we encourage and go looking for losing chemicals we want dopamine and uh testosterone and progesterone and the comp- the the chemicals that are pro-life yeah, it's funny. Funny, I've been seeing internet memes, like health memes, with dopamine and serotonin, and then a little table, like an infographic, and it's basically programming people. Serotonin is better than dopamine, and dopamine's you know a quick, uh, a, a quick um, kind of hit, and then serotonin's you know supposedly a good hit and you know long lasting. And I'm like, you guys need to read Ray Pete's article on serotonin. Look into the whole SSRI connection. I think because. People that have taken antidepressants, they've lived it, so they know kind of what's going on with those. (laughs) Some people are wising up about that, and I found out about serotonin back in the 70s. When I studied with a person, all meditators say develop the parasympathetic nervous system. My mentor said the sympathetic nervous system. I brought experts to see him, and they said, that guy's crazy. But think about it. We call it... uh, uh, what is it? Rest and digest. That's the parasympathetic. Well, if we did that all the time, what about standing on your own two feet? With the sympathetic nervous system, it's called sympathetic tone. I'm here and I can do this. But as soon as the tone goes gone out of the sympathetic, I fall to the ground. I can even be dislocated. So obviously, they've made a bias here. This is paid and rest. This is stress. You're running from the enemy. You have to fight or flight. They call it fight or flight. The other is rest and digest, fight or flight. Interesting how they word that very cleverly like a lawyer. But sympathetic tone is necessary. And now it's starting to, there are experts who are starting to realize that it's the sympathetic nervous system that allows us to do martial arts, to do football, to have better sex, to do all the things we do, to log, and to carry on our life. So if we had nothing but the sympathetic nervous system, I mean the parasympathetic, we would lie down. And there's even a lie about the sympathetic nervous system being that it's parasympathetic to be have an erection. That's not true either. There's other ways to get it. In fact, Viagra can be, can be uh, replaced by movement leg exercises, squats, and those, uh, whatever you call the squeezes and the, the ones where you go out in the gym and with carbon dioxide. That's the real Viagra and the safest one. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. That, I'm glad you brought up the different nervous system branches because I know that you're a big fan of coffee. I am. And I, I recently heard a prominent biohacker say that he takes breaks like once a month, he'll go on one week of decaf to reset, I think, adenosine receptors or something. He described the biochemistry of why that is. I have i don't know if I buy that. Do you, do you believe that you need to take breaks from caffeine? Because caffeine, what it's doing is it's activating your sympathetic, right? Yep. Uh, you know, th- there's a case for that. Uh, 
The only reason I do, I take off for five days sometimes to see if I'm addicted. Do I get headaches? Do I feel like all that stuff? I never have got them. So that's my test that I do. Hmm. And in fact, they ha- they used to have something called environmental nutrition. There was another name for it, orthomolecular nutrition, where they would say, if you want to find out if you're allergic to the food, be off it for at least five days or a week. And then if you have an allergic reaction, then that's part of the addiction pattern. And then to be off it for six to nine months. There's some truth to that. But uh, I've been on coffee all this time, and I just once in a while take five days off to just see if I'm going to get a whole bunch of things. I sleep a little more. uh, That's admitted. But uh, otherwise, I don't seem to have any problem by getting off it. You don't ever do decaf, do you? Uh, never. But but Ray Pete says there are uh, beneficial things in uh, in uh, decaf. Uh, the caffeic acid is still there, and there are other chemicals. Remember, it has magnesium, it has niacinamide, and it has other chemicals in it too. I think there's uh, some a little bit of calcium and uh, other things that they don't mention. There's about 500 things in in coffee. Caffeine also can act as an insect poison. So there's that. But at the same time, human beings don't, sometimes one animal has a resistance to it and doesn't. Humans seem to have a remarkable resistance to it that some animals don't have. So you might be careful about feeding it to your pets without going to a vet and finding out what the effects are going to be. But humans, uh, there's been people who have lived on as much as 80 cups of coffee. Of course, they took the, the small ones. In other words, they'd die of water poisoning or liquid poisoning. Uh, and Voltaire used to joke. I think it was Voltaire is attributed to, uh, yeah, it's a slow poison. I'm 82, and it's been poisoning me all my life. <laughs> and he drank a lot. Benjamin Franklin drank a lot. And Wall Street was started in a coffee shop in Manhattan. That's where it wow. started. <laughs> I, I wonder if because caffeine is a bug killer, if it's it has like an antimicrobial kind of antiparasitic effect, kind of like tobacco, because coffee drinkers and tobacco users are longer lived generally, right? Yeah, if they with tobacco, they get lung cancer. That's one of the problems. Mm-hmm. But tobacco in small amounts can have therapeutic effects against Alzheimer's and other diseases. You have to be careful. And of course, I'm talking about natural tobacco because they put a whole bunch of uh, other things. You've probably seen what was that movie? Uh, with Al Pacino and Russell Crowe about the Seven Sisters and how they put bullets, uh, bullets in his mailbox and pornography on his computer and everything to get him to not tell the truth that they were loading cigarettes up with chemicals. All seven companies. And by the way, I know R.J. Reynolds. I knew him while he was alive. He was a Sufi, and I uh, knew him personally. The only thing he used the tobacco for, he said, if you ever get a bee sting, tobacco is the best thing. Put it on, but. Josh, that's what we call him. He died of lung cancer. <laughs> wow. What 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 are good things for the lungs? I mean, if, I'm, I'd imagine supporting your metabolism and don't panic or don't have grief because grief issues you'll find, and they've known that from a long time ago. When people have grief issues, it attacks the lungs. They get colds, they get flus, and they get pneumonia. And this has been known for years and years. Now. Uh, morning foods that look like the lungs tend to protect the lungs. And one of the main premier foods is the orange. <laughs> That's one of the best wow. lung, lung protection. I've known that for a long time, that that uh, oranges protect the lungs. That's awesome. <laughs> um, I just found cold-pressed juice recently because I can't really get good oranges up here. And it doesn't taste the same as fresh, but it's the closest I can get. <laughs> I think uh, Ray P doesn't seem to mind that much. They put a lot of chemicals in. They add citric, citric acid. But I think when you get something natural and it tastes good and agrees with you, you can do it. Best to get the fresh oranges. But, you know, if I was uh, living in a place where I couldn't get them, I would look for what I would think would be the best looking uh, uh, juice. I, I don't like the ones added calcium, added this. They're always trying to add something. And they're probably even putting fish oil in the doggone stuff by now. But, uh, yeah, I, I just go for the juice then and get what you thought was the best one. You can research some of that on the Internet. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, a few more questions here. What what are the differences between cold and hot coffee? Some ask. Uh, well, too cold coffee. They used to think that uh, – that, uh, 
coffee could give you cancer, hot liquids can. Uh, when you burn your mouth at 500 or 600 degrees, like in a pizza crust, that's the worst. You can actually cause that. Uh, so you shouldn't drink too hot of liquids. Uh, otherwise, uh, your your warm coffee will uh, will you'll digest it better. The stomach doesn't like cold liquids. In fact, Dr. William Beaumont, a surgeon who had the opportunity to look at a guy's hole in his stomach and measure it for like a decade, he actually found that uh, if you took cold liquids, even, what was it, about 50, no, 60 degrees or something, it would shut the stomach down for an hour, half an hour half an hour at that. Now, we drink much colder liquids. Now, there's an advantage. If you want to gain weight, do cold liquids. I used to tell uh, bodybuilders that do the bench press and drink some cold water afterwards, and they could gain four pounds. Now, that's if eight ounce glass of water does not have uh, four pounds. What is happening? Gas. If, it was, if we weren't built of gas, think of a tree. It's hard as a rock. You could break your hand on it, but that tree, if it actually ate the ground, it would dig a hole in the forest. It's nothing but carbon dioxide and oxygen. And where does our fat go when we lose weight? Does it evaporate into, uh, into the ether? No. It comes out as 84% carbon dioxide and 16% water. Wow. Yeah, I remember growing up and whenever I'd get a cold or a flu, I like – belched a lot and it went, went out especially specifically a sore throat and this was an observation i made my entire childhood like if i belched or passed gas you know both ends whatever i felt better um and it was, almost felt like the gas pressure was keeping me sick i don't know if that's true <laughs> oh no it can definitely a lot of uh pressurization uh, diseases now i wrote ray pete about yawning he's not a fan of it because of the uh uh, he says it doesn't make any difference. But all animals yawn. And what I'm talking about, the therapeutic one is where you do an extended yawn. And usually it goes something like uh, 10 seconds in, 10 seconds hold, 10 seconds out, 10 seconds release. Well, when you do an extended yawn, you're building up carbon dioxide. And by doing those simple techniques, you can end up holding your – doing one breath a minute. And uh, – uh, you can actually extend your life by breathing slower. Look at a turtle. They breathe once every, no, four times a minute, and they live to 300 years. And you'll find that the faster an animal breathes, uh, to live longer, they have to do like a hummingbird. They breathe so quickly, but people don't know that they, what they call estivate. There's a, actually another word for it. It's like hibernate during the day. Most of their time are like bats. They go completely still. And then they go and fly all around, and we see them acting so crazy, just like a bat. They spend most of their time in a hibernation state and protect that. So they can live 10 or 12 years when if they flew all the time and didn't do that, they'd only live not even a year. Wow. Do you think there's a benefit to like holding your breath on walks until you have the desire to breathe, just like kind of intermittently – building up the carbon dioxide that way? Or? I think it can help. Yeah, I, th I think the Buteco method, which was actually practiced by the American Indians for, for centuries, and the artist uh, George uh, – um, uh, he was a famous Indian artist, and I'm not thinking of his last name right now. But he wrote a book on how keeping the mouth closed and breathing was part of every Indian – village that he ever went to paint Indian. George Caitlin, C-A-I-T-L-E-N, I believe. Uh, he went to these villages. He wrote a book about it way before Buteyko was even born, before he was a gleam in his mother's eye. He was writing about that. And he even describes in his book, there's a fight between a small Indian and a very large white man. And they're going to go take, it, take, it, take it out with knives. And they break it up finally. So the author went over and said, Weren't you afraid of that big white guy? He's twice as big as you. No, because he has his, he leaves his mouth open. I can take anyone with his mouth open. <laughs> the wow. Indian the Indian mothers would stay up all night with their baby and make sure the mouth was closed all night. That there was no open mouth to sleeping in almost every tribe in America.
they knew that. And they were different tribes from different places. They had the Baskins came from a totally different place than the Iroquois and the Aztecs and the Mayans. And yet, how did they all know this? Wow. Yeah, I had a Shark Tank uh, company uh, I interviewed earlier this year that created the mouth tape, like called Somnifix. And I started with just the 3M medical tape, but this one has like less chemicals, hypoallergenic, whatever. But um, I've heard from people that just mouth taping while they sleep for a month, it's like training wheels, where if you're a mouth breather, when you sleep, your body will train to nose breathe uh, just yep. by taping your mouth. <laughs> Yep. Eventually, you want to. They trained him so you could do it automatically. That you would be sleeping in that method because when you tape it, you're doing it artificially. But it is a start. And when people start thinking about it, a lot of times, I go to the farmers market and I look at people. And uh, when you think of it, if you want to draw a photo or a, a art rendering of a retarded person. I'm right away, you look retarded. Well, the person, well, there's a whole bunch of people walking around the market with their mouth hanging open, and it really is interesting, you know. And by the way, the germ protector is our nose, not, not the, the mouth actually comes in, but we have both mucus that flows it out and little cilia that we don't have in our mouth that protects us from just about anything that's out there. When you have your mouth closed, you're much less uh, likely get anything and despite what they say corona and rhinoviruses can travel one mile they use them in pig yeah no that that was it <laughs> that's the ridiculous thing with the mask thing right i mean because the people that are so aggressive about that that are like forcing other people to do it um they're probably mouth breathers right <laughs> well i think it's a ridiculous thing of it if uh <laughs> Sounds like a stampede there. <laughs> the uh, Think of the ridiculousness of it. If I have my mask that I've been wearing for about three weeks and I say, here, I'm going to donate it to your surgeon and so your surgeon can use it for surgery, they're going to throw it in a waste paper basket. Do you know, I, I'm confessing this right now, our masks are 20 years old. We have the N95, but they're 20 years old. We, 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 they were old when we used them for the evacuation because they came in handy during the fire here when we got evacuated because there was soot all over the place. Like there's still soot downstairs that I haven't cleaned up. It was piled two inches deep, and the bathroom was this uh, with a crack in the window. It was an inch deep when we came back from being evacuated. So there's a point for N95s for that, but. Uh, it's uh, it just doesn't do anything. I have a Israeli gas mask, you know, the creepy one with just the you can see through the eyes. And before this whole thing's over, I want to get a shirt that says like it's a it, the whole thing's a scam and wear that into into a store and have someone fill me. <laughs> I, I, I'd love to go down with a hazmat suit and walk into those places. <laughs> yeah, it's you know, it's 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 a scam. We won't talk about it too much. I don't want to get you kicked off the air here. <laughs> but I think we haven't said any of the, the really bad words. So, <laughs> right, the AI can't uh, figure us out. Yeah. <laughs> but um, well, thank you for being so generous with your time. Um, I I think. We had a bunch of questions, but I'll just have to have you on more often. Maybe we could do like more of a once a month thing. Cause I think the average has been every three to four or so. Consistently. <laughs> I'd love it. And again, my offers there, any, any of the, uh, the new, uh, yellow fat disease books, you got them for free, Matt. So appreciate oh. all you do. Oh, I really appreciate that. Yeah. And I'll put the link below to, uh, so people can check out. Um, yeah, it looks like in the last few months, um, well, I guess your sex newsletter two is coming out next month, right? I'm looking no, it's website. already out. I'm on three. Oh. I'm almost done with oh, three. Okay. And it's in January, but I think I'm going to release it early because I need the money. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, I'm just about on the final. I have 12 subjects. I'm on number 12. All I got to do that. Vibrant Gal will probably have it for proof reaping. But she told me, don't tell people in advance because they start buying the one when we don't have it posted up on the thing yet. So don't buy number three yet, please. <laughs> we have one and two up though they are for sale that's november's and december's uh newsletters that's awesome yeah whenever people ask me well where's the proof for the omega-3 thing and i'll send them raised free articles but then i also tell them about the the lipofuscin 
you have the bundle and that's a really good uh, it's an easy read too because you use quotes and stuff it's not just yep. you know hard you know hard some of them stuff. are scientific but i try to interpret in between and the reason i put those scientific tests kind of i could be making this stuff up but i show test after test after test i go through every animal from ants to bears to donkeys to people and some people say humans are the worst for lipopuskin diseases. I don't find that though. I think we're somewhere in the middle. Uh, cats are a little worse. Horses are a little worse. Alligators are the worst. And uh, some other animals like cows have uh, more resistance than we do. For whatever reason, over time, it just evolved that way. But, uh, but anyway, every animal, I don't know a single animal that isn't vulnerable to a greater or lesser degree to yellow fat disease. And that's what they don't tell you. If, if you mentioned to Jack Cruz, I would say, if we, someone said, what about Jack Cruz? Look up yellow fat disease. Don't look up omega-3 fatty acids. Don't look up linoleic acid. Look up yellow fat disease. And it's the only thing I can think of that leads always leads to yellow fat disease by taking them, greater or lesser. If vitamin E slows it down, selenium slows it down, other things slow it down. But if you're going to continue taking those, you overload it, and it figures ways to get around these things. If you minimize it, take vitamin E, maybe a little selenium carefully on that. Too much can be a problem. Uh, in fact, probably it's good to just stick to vitamin E because the selenium in your body will be picked up by it. And uh, then you're going to be uh, reasonably safe to keeping it low and with vitamin E. And That's healthy awesome. Food. And I low iron. Be- Low iron, yeah. My cat will be a cool experiment because she has such a soft coat whenever anyone pets her. Like, wow, she's so soft. And um, yeah, I mean, giving her vitamin E, maybe that'll help, even though she has the poofas in her food that I can't avoid. <laughs> yeah, they're going to do it. But it would be a good idea because even, I forget, there was a advertised, someone really did a healthy food, uh, but they insisted on adding uh fish oil to it or dha or something so but they but they brainwash you know i hung out with uh what was his name andrew weil you i'm sure you've heard of him i hung out with him at one time uh and he's really an honest guy but he just fell for the research uh he's he hasn't fallen for a lot of other things that have gone on there i admire him for that so i went right to see if he had fallen for it and he did you know almost everybody except you and I and Ray Pete and oh and and there are other people who know. Even Brian Peskin is somewhat on that list, knowing that it's toxic when you take it as a supplement. Of course, yeah. Jack P- Jack Cruz wrongly said uh, Ray Pete is only talking about supplemental, not fish. And that's not true. Ray Pete says the fish do. It's you can get too much of anything, and uh, it's advisable. Not to eat fish just like a cat wouldn't or a lion wouldn't or a dog wouldn't go into the ocean unless they were desperate. Dogs have learned to catch monkeys too, to catch fish when there's no other food available. The English knew that. It was an inferior protein. So during the 1800s, they would feed their workers the fish to keep them moving so they do the work. They didn't care about their longevity. They just wanted their their work power at the point and meanwhile the english didn't eat their fish at that point that was way before kippers and eggs or whatever they uh they have now wow yeah i think there's because it's always shown me the study that's like the the brainwashing line that comes out of people's mouth to me every single day kind of thing but i think case studies there's something to be said of those and jack cruz you know i was on stage with him last year and so i saw him you know he was a foot away from me um, Dr. Dan Amen, he's another PUFA promoter. And I mean, you can yeah. see the lipofuscan on his head. That's a brain doctor wow. and heavy omega fish oil, uh, recommend, you know, so I think looking at people, we can kind of see there's, you know, Jack Cruz, he does a lot of red wine. He, he talks about it all the time, a lot of sunlight, unlimited sun exposure, unlimited UV. He's doing the red light, but it doesn't seem to be balancing it. And he's getting the copper, which supposedly regulates the iron to protect against lipofuscan, but it's not enough. So uh, I don't know. It's, it's interesting. <laughs> you know, one of the tragedy comedies about uh, Dr. Amen is that to look at your brain for emotional small stuff, he irradiates you with a CAT scan. And a CAT scan is like 
eating fish oil only on steroids. And when you combine fish oil, recommending that and those disease, you're killing people. I hate to say it, but I've wow. had a, a a bone to pick, let's say, with uh, Dr. Amen for a long time. He also puts the meat before the mind. And I'm more like a Rupert Sheldrake. I put the mind before the meat. And uh, anyway, that's the difference. But Dr. Amen has been, I have both of his, two of his books here. But I'm not a big fan of Dr. Men at all. Way behind, way north of the cheering section. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, well, thanks, Adam. Yeah, let's do this more often, and I'll save these questions so for for next time. I think I we have a, you know, a backlog from the previous interview. So <laughs> yeah, we do. We, do. <laughs> we have enough material. So <laughs> thanks for inviting me. Enjoy shoveling snow up there. $40 billion a year industry, the omega-3 industry. Isn't that incredible? Now, I had no idea that they're actually being incorporated into 88 pharmaceutical drugs that are ready to be approved by the FDA. That is absolutely insane and at the same time doesn't surprise me. And a lot of the people taking these are probably also on birth control, which contain iron and estrogen which are components of lipofuscin so you have all three of the pillars to create this melted plastic in the cells really freaky stuff it's like the perfect storm and that's why i simplify health i think of all these conditions could it be as simple as just accumulation of calcification or lipofuscin or fibrosis should we really be focusing on and trying to chase symptoms to figure out what's wrong with us? Or should we just look at context? Like in my case, hey, I ate a lot of Honey Nut Cheerios. I ate a lot of Lucky Charms. I had a lot of vegetables. I went through a vegetable juice raw vegan phase, which contains enormous amounts of iron. And... Maybe I should think about that moving forward instead of just looking at one little symptom that I have and trying to figure out my health from that. It doesn't make any sense at all. And I believe that lipofuscin and omega-3s or polyunsaturated fatty acids are absolutely the root cause of disease. And there are solutions. You know, I believe vitamin E is one of those and limiting polyunsaturated fatty acid intake in the diet, and also consuming sugar, consuming carbohydrates, because your liver needs glycogen to clear these PUFAs out. And choline also helps, not supplemental, but from raw egg yolks or sunny-side-up eggs, pastured eggs, of course. The solutions are fairly simple. I feel like most people are focusing on the wrong thing, trying to do these wild cleanses and celery juice, which will make things worse. Instead of focusing in on drinking and bathing water and your fat intake, whether it's saturated or predominantly unsaturated, whether you're restricting carbohydrates, whether you're getting enough animal protein, and when you do all of this, your mental and emotional health will actually improve. Your resilience will increase and you'll have an increased stress buffer. So things that normally bothered you won't anymore. And that's especially important in 2020 when there are obviously people that are trying to kill us and poison us. You know, what's new, but it's just being ramped up. And so the stress is being increased. And so you have to match that with focusing on your health and your physical health and your nutrition and all this basic stuff. It's really foundational, but it will change your whole life. I'll put a link below to Adam Bergstrom's website. It's solartiming.com. That's where you can buy all of his eBooks and check out his work. I love Adam. He's going to be a return guest. I learned so much from him and he always gives me new stuff to look into and I did not know that vitamin E is chelated selenium. That makes sense. I've been talking about selenium lately because I always get 
questions on uh, coated silver or nano silver or colloidal silver and whether I recommend it. And the answer is 100% no, it's toxic. It will actually deplete selenium. And so I always ask people, why are they taking what they're taking? What is it for? Right? And if it's for you know, antibacterial effects, you'd be better off taking P73 wild Mediterranean oil of oregano it's a lot safer and there won't be that side effect of depleting a mineral that is responsible for a lot, uh, largely preventing a cancer formation. So a little announcement, Black Friday sale is going on at mitolife.co Friday, Saturday through Sunday for 20% off. The code is BF2020 and you could try out some Mito Life products. I know a lot are out of stock. I apologize. Uh, in the next week or two, those will start coming back in stock and I'll likely run another sale. So just stay tuned. You can sign up for the Mito Life newsletter so you get an email or follow the Instagram and we'll announce it there. But thanks so much for your support for Mito Life Radio. I have a new episode released every Friday. Please share it with your friends. Leave a review, really helps me out. And let's get this information out there. You know, vitamin D supplementation, omega-3 supplementation, zinc, ascorbic acid, these are really trending right now. And so we could really help a lot of people by showing them the truth, showing them what these supplements do to the body to throw it out of balance. And my website is matt-blackburn.com. I have the magnesium bicarbonate up there right on the front page that I always recommend to almost everyone. And you can make it yourself. That is definitely the best case scenario. But if you want to just get on it and buy it pre-made, I have the products up there. And most of the products there on the website have discount codes. So it helps me in the show out and it also helps you out by giving you a little discount. Today's quote is from Adam Bergstrom's book, Age Spots, Omega-3 Barcodes, 2017. What does cold thermogenesis do to lipofuscin? Acute exposure to cold, 55 degrees Fahrenheit and below for up to 60 minutes, can lead to a massive accumulation of lipofuscin in arachnoendothelium, according to the Institute for Problems of Cryobiology and cryomedicine of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine. People were soaking in bathtubs packed with ice cubes to, quote, lose weight, when this actually stimulates weight gain with dementia as a side effect. It only lops off weeks, months, or a few years off people's lives, so who notices? No one notices the difference between someone dying at 82 instead of living another three years until 85. Who detects death by a thousand paper cuts in a fast food and quick cure nation? But susceptible people do notice age spots appearing and multiplying on their skin.